If anyone, if anyone has technical problems, feel free to bug me before we start. Um, if you want to, you want me to come over just before, yeah. the URL. 
Okay, so maybe I'll, yeah, maybe I'll get started. Um, hopefully, there's a few technical problems here and there, but hopefully they aren't too serious. A few people have older versions of SciPy, so I'm using the bleeding edge version of SciPy in the notebook, which is 0.19. Um, but, uh, but if you have an older version, you can probably follow along pretty well. There's just one or two like, bleeding edge examples that won't work on your machine. But you can always just watch me, uh, watch me do it. Um, or you can just try, try, try to update it um, as I go through. Because um, I think there's a fair bit of material before we get to the stuff that's, um, that's requiring 0 0.19. There's a few housekeeping notes. They left a sheet for me up here um, that I have to tell you about. There's a survey monkey survey thing. Um, the URL, I'll just try to highlight it up here, surveymonkey.com slash r slash pycon 171, so that you can give feedback on the tutorial. Um, so I have to tell you that. Um, the break, there will be a break at 10.15, it says, um, in the lobby just outside the room. Lunch is at 20 after 12 in the Oregon Ballroom, 201, 204, which is upstairs. Um, at lunch, those who have requested a kosher meal should let a server know. Um, it's a separate buffet station for vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, and halal meals. Um, and they say here that they've placed as many power outlets as they can in the room, but please um, share with your neighbors and that sort of thing. And, um, and yeah, if you have technical problems and maybe your neighbor seems to know what they're doing, much appreciated if you can sort of help each other out. Um, but if you really need to, I can also come and, come and look at what's going on um, if needed. Um, so the entire tutorial uh, is in a single Jupyter notebook. It's this one here, or IPython notebook, if you're still using the old terminology. So I try to keep it all in one single notebook, and pretty much everything is requiring SciPy. There are a few other libraries. I try to keep all the imports, the important imports, in the first executable cell of the notebook, so you can just execute that and see if there's any issues right off the bat. Um, if you do have an older version of SciPy, again, you should be able to get by as long as it's not super, super old. I think 0.17 is probably okay. 0.18 is a bit better because that has the, um, the spherical Voronoi stuff, and then 0.19 has like everything that you need. Um, but if you're really far behind, this is where the, the GitHub repo is. Um, and we can get, there's, I think there's a few USB sticks floating around. I don't have the repo on it, but we could get it on it if we need to, because um, some people do have network problems. I guess there's a lot of people using the Wi-Fi. Um, but the repo is here, it's on GitHub. And uh, so everything should be in this notebook here, mastering scipy.spatial. I've got a summary of the dependencies there, and the talk outline is below it. We'll see if we can get through all that stuff, all that stuff today. Um, so I, I gave a tutorial last year which was focused um, more broadly on computational geometry in Python. And this year I'm focusing very specifically on the scipy library. Um, perhaps in part because I'm, that's my main focus for contributing to the open source um, computational geometry community in Python. Um, and also because the 1.0, the sort of stable version of, I mean, SciPy's been stable for a while, but the 1.0 release is, is, um, is certainly on the horizon. It's the next release that's intended. Um, point 19 was released a few, a few months ago. Um, hopefully this cuts down on library dependencies too, so it should make um, the talk um, and the dependencies of the talk a little bit um, more focused and less complicated than, than, than last year. Um, I tried to add some development notes throughout the talk. So I have these little tables formatted like this throughout the talk. Um, because I'm involved in the development process, um, I just thought it, you might find it interesting to know what's, what's new and what's still causing problems. Um, some of these are issues, so, so users have raised concerns on the GitHub and these are things that are sort of being debated. And some of you might have thought, some of you might be working with sort of really um, high quality commercial software and things like GIS and, and, and related fields. And you might actually have thoughts on, on, on ways to solve these problems. So I'd love to hear that, hear that too. Um, and hopefully, yeah, hopefully maybe that inspires you to also to contribute or to, to tell us what we could do better to, to interface with your specific fields. Um, one of the key references that I used in preparing the talk last year, and, uh, and again, just to go over things for this year, because this isn't my uh, formal field, so I'm a, a biochemist, um, so I usually have to go over a textbook, so I'm not um, completely clueless on some sections. Um, so Discrete and Computational Geometry, which is by Davidos and O'Rourke. Um, and jo Joseph O'Rourke has actually written a whole bunch of high quality um, computational geometry textbooks, so his work is usually a pretty good bet for, for background in the field. Um, and some t so some components of the talk, 
from last year, like really uh, crucial computational geometry concepts. Um, the convex hull, the Delaunay triangulation, Voronoi diagrams will be um, sort of preserved in this year's version of the talk, but many other sections are sort of um, really quite new and, 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 and parts of, of sci-fi and spatial that are really, um, really just starting to, to, to appear and to, and to grow. Um, so just to sort of start off with a really um, straightforward definition of computational geometry, it's just the study of computer algorithms that perform geometric operations, which is a fairly, um, fairly broad description. Um, there's a lot of applications, computer graphics, um, architecture, so um, drafting, design with CAD, um, robotic motion planning and, and collision avoidance, and we'll have an example of that today. Um, geographic information systems is a big one. I think a lot of the people that I talk to um, from my talks work in, work in the GIS field. Um, computer vision, um, a much smaller application is, is mine, computational biochemistry and virology. There's a pe few people doing um, spatial analysis in that field. Epidemiology, water source contamination, that's one of the first actually um, modern examples of, of using computational geometry. Um, we'll, have that, um, we'll have that example today. Um, ecology, where um, animal sightings tell you things about habitats. Integrated circuit design, which I know pretty much nothing about. Um, economical construction of physical networks, so if you want to minimize the amount of wiring connecting nodes in a network, if it's really expensive wiring, um, that's, a, that's an application of computational geometry. And even looking at um, the ranges of cooking ingredients that give you a really sort of pleasing outcome for um, culinary applications, um, so there's success polygons. I've never actually done that, but that's also an application of, of computational geometry. Um, and it's a really young field, so it started in the, the 19, maybe the late 60s, early 1970s. Um, the first paper, w arguably the first paper was in 1972, actually. Um, so it's fairly young as far as, um, as, far as mathematical fields go. Um, but it's sort of been permeating through uh, mathematics for a much longer time. And this is a, um, a figure taken out of a, a textbook by Oren Hammer, um, a well-known mathematician, which is actually taken out of another work by René Descartes um, several hundred years ago showing um, stars and the matter around stars. And this actually looks a lot like a Voronoi diagram. So, so even though these uh, sort of the computational algorithms are quite recent, um, the applications and, and, and thoughts related to applications have been around for a few hundred years. Um, so if you execute this first cell in the notebook, that should give you an idea of if you have any major um, dependency related issues. Hopefully most of you don't have anything, um, any issues that are too serious there. Um, so what I'm gonna start out with is um, fairly straightforward topics initially. Um, and I think one of the first things that I think about when I want to um, pull up the SciPy the spatial library and do some work is if I want to find the distances between arrays of points. So I have two data sets with points and I want to know, for example, what are the closest neighbors between those two data sets or what are the farthest neighbors or what's the, different, the distance between the mean of the data points in one set and the mean of the data points in the other set. Um, so this is a very, very common use of, of, of SciPy. Um, but actually, I had never used um, this distance matrix function. So I normally use cdist or pdist, which many of you may also agree on. But I thought I'd, I'd go through it. So this is distance matrix. We have, um, for example, um, the Euclidean distance. And there's a bit of sort of jargon in the field. So they call it the L2 norm. So there's a mathematician named Minkowski. And they, we use Minkowski norms to sort of describe what kind of distance we're calculating. And we'll cover two of these today. One being the two norm, which is just the classical Euclidean distance. And the other one that we'll cover is called the one norm, which is the city block distance. So if you want to calculate the sort of taxi cab distance from one point in New York to another, you wouldn't necessarily want to look at the Euclidean distance because that would go through buildings. You'd actually want to look at city blocks, which is also something you probably have to do in mapping, for example, mapping applications. But we'll start off with, um, with Euclidean distance. And I think I've just written up a sort of very simple example where you have an autonomous vehicle and it has coordinates for an animal that has sort of suddenly entered the road. And you want to know um, the distance between the vehicle and the, the obstruction on the road. Um, so we have these coordinates. And in many places throughout the talk, I'm just using random data. I've tried to make somewhat realistic examples, but use random data so we don't have to pull in um, real data sets that might have other dependencies. Um, so we import the distance matrix, and then we just calculate the distance using distance matrix between these two arrays of coordinates. And then if we look at the shape of the, of the output, that can give us some useful information. So there's 50 rows in that distance matrix and 600 columns. 
Um, so maybe this is obvious, but maybe it's not. So the 50 rows are all the coordinates on the vehicle, this autonomous vehicle. And these 600 columns, those are all the coordinates on the, uh, on the animal or the obstruction in the road. Um, so each of the values in that matrix is a distance between one point in the vehicle and one point on the obstruction. So it's a very convenient return data structure that is quite intuitive to work with. Um, and then often you want to know the maximum or the minimum distance. So if you want to know, for example, how long the vehicle has to stop, you want to know the closest distance at the moment. Um, so for that, we just can use this, the minimum method of the NumPy array to calculate the closest distance. So hopefully that is fairly straightforward. Um, and do feel free to interrupt me if there's um, questions or, um, or you think I'm doing something wrong or something like that. Um, so I mentioned that we have these, again, this, this sort of uh, norm terminology. So now we have the L1 norm, um, Minkowski norm. Um, so this is the city block distance or the rectilinear distance, some people call it. Um, and I've written up a, a short example here again. You have a self-driving vehicle, but this time, it, you know, somehow through satellite or GPS or awareness of other vehicles, um, you, you have the, the information that um, there's an obstruction that's somewhere else, and it's, um, it's around a few city blocks, for example. So you want to use this Minkowski L1 city block distance. Um, so we, we use basically the same data set. We use the same function, distance matrix up here. We have the vehicle coordinates and the animal coordinates again. But we have this extra argument for the P norm or the Minkowski norm. So instead of setting it to two, which would be the classical Euclidean distance, we set it to one, which is the city block distance. And we get the same matrix. So again, 50 rows for the values on the vehicle and 600 rows for the values on the obstruction. And then if we, for example, again, want to figure out what the minimum distance is, we just execute that code there, and we get a value for the minimum distance out of all of those possible combinations of distances between the two data sets. Um, but actually, so I've never actually used that, that function. I've always used um, CDIST and PDIST, which are very, very similar. Um, and I think I, I just did some testing, and it looks like CDIST is almost always faster. It's written in very optimized um, C code. Um, so let's just take a look at this. So I've got some, just some um, cell-level magic functions for timing the code. So if we time the distance matrix between the vehicle coordinates and the animal coordinates. There we go, about a millisecond. And now let's try the same thing for CDIS between the same sets of coordinates. I'll just repeat it so you believe me. Hopefully it's faster. It should be faster. does a few trials, that's why it takes longer than the actual time. Um, but yeah, so it looks like it's about, what is that, not quite 10 times faster, but it's certainly faster. And these are fairly small data sets too, so for really big data sets, I think you typically want to use CDIST. Um, and, uh, and yeah, just to, just to sort of prove that you get the same, the same result for both. So if you use this distance matrix, which I've never actually used until I prepared this tutorial um, between the vehicle and the animal um, with the P equals two norm versus CDIS where you call using this argument here. So you use metric equals Euclidean instead of specifying the, the norm value. Um, and you get, so you get the same minimum from those two data sets. Was there a question there? No? OK. Um, but that was just, that's just for the, the, um, sorry, the fairly straightforward Euclidean distance. So I thought I'd also compare distance matrix with CDIS for um, the city block distance, the L1 norm. So we try that, just try it, time the uh, value there, distance matrix. So here we just notice that we've got P equals one. So that's gonna do a city block distance as opposed to a straight line Euclidean distance. So this is 916 microseconds. Um, for CDIS, just take a note of the call signature here. So you should, you should always specify the, the metric with a string here. So that'll, that'll make sure that you're using the optimized C code version. There's also a Minkowski function that's in the the distance module of scipy.spatial, but you shouldn't provide that argument because that would use the Python version of the code. Um, so it's, oh, it's always a good idea if you're using CDIS or PDIS to use this metric equals and specify with the string so that you make sure that you're using the optimized version of the code. And here we're going to specify P equals 1 for, for um, the Minkowski distance, um, rectilinear or city block distance. But here you'll actually see it's slower. So it's actually 3 milliseconds if we specify it that way. Um, but luckily, there's actually another metric specification down here, city block. So this is, this is the optimized C version for use with CDIST. And as I, you can see there that the time is faster. I'll just repeat it to, 
to make sure that we believe that it's faster. So we had 916 microseconds, and now we have 103. So it's almost nine times faster than using distance matrix with the p equals one Minkowski norm. So that's pretty good. Um, so just, just be careful with these calling conventions so that you're getting, the, especially if you're working with like huge data sets, so you get the, the optimal um, performance. You want to specify the metric properly. And if you look at the doc string for, for cdist, I can think I can even pull it up here with, um, so if I just look for cdist, I just have the docs here. Um, you can see all the different values for the metrics here. There's a whole bunch of them. So city blocks up here, but there's all kinds of other ones. So that's another reason to use cdist over distance matrix is that we have the option of using all of these all of these, so that's in the, the doc string, but um, yeah, there's all these different options for metric, for the metric. And again, just to be sure that we're getting the same values, so that the comparison is fair, I just did that there, and it says, it says it's true that they're the same. Um, and same thing for the rectilinear, so um, yeah, so we get the same results. Um, so I thought I'd, um, I thought I'd also cover an example of doing CDIS for something that maybe a little bit more sophisticated or a distance that you might not be accustomed to. Certainly I wasn't, I have never actually used this distance before I prepared the tutorial. Um, so it's called the Mahalanobis distance. I'm maybe not saying that correctly. Um, it's often used in clustering and outlier detection. Apparently the first usage was actually for looking at um, similarities between skulls. So doing metric um, anatomical assignments. Um, and it basically takes into account the covariance in the data. So looking at the sort of shape of the data when you're calculating the distance. Um, It'll probably be a fair bit clearer when we do the example. And so what I've basically done is I've, I've prepared two data sets. One is this green circular data set, and the other is this blue elliptical data set. And I'm going to try to calculate the distance between all of the points on the circle and the mean value of all of the points in the ellipse. And what will happen is basically the, this Mahalanobis distance will account for the shape of this data set here, so that the points on the circle that are closer to the edges of the ellipse will be closer to the center, even though every point in this circle is equidistant to, or roughly equidistant to, the average value of all the points in the ellipse. So you're kind of accounting for shape when you're, when you're doing this kind of distance calculation. Um, it's a slightly confusing thing, though, because actually CDIS would, would it normally calculate the distances between all of the points on the circle and all of the points in this ellipse, accounting for shape, but I thought it would be easier just for demonstration purposes to focus on the mean point in the ellipse. So we'll just, we'll just see what happens if I do that. You have to provide a covariance, so that's why I have all these fancy calculations with numpy dot, numpy dot covariance, and you have to take the inverse of that. So there's, a, there's a, this inverse covariance argument to CDIST. So the circle data, the ellipse centroid, so I've just taken the average value of all the points in the ellipse and I'm providing this Mahalanobis metric for the distance type, and then the only sort of complicated thing is that we have to prepare this, um, this covariance matrix. I think it'll actually calculate it automatically if you don't provide it, but then that would normally be for the calculation of all points in one data set to all points in the other. Um, but I think if you look at the result, it'll make, it'll make sense from the, so I have a sort of heat map style plot here, and so the distances, the dark distances are really small, and the bright distances are really large. And so the points that are closer to the edges of the ellipse, so that, that are closer to the matching the shape of the ellipse have really small values. And the points that are farther away from the edges of the ellipse um, have quite large distances. So this is a sort of nice, this is just one of many examples of um, useful metrics for certain applications. I think this is used a lot in statistics, for example. Um, so not, not only is CDIS faster than distance matrix, but it also has um, the option of using all of these sort of really fancy distance metrics that may be useful in your particular fields. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's still, maybe to me it's a, a little bit confusing that you can actually calculate. So it makes sense that you would calculate the distances from the average, but how do you calculate the distance between all the points in the circle and all the points on, say, every single point on that ellipse? But um, but if you're better at stats than I, then maybe your head can wrap around that a little better than mine. And to be fair, there is also this development note, so there's some possible issues with the, um, with the way that we call this function. So if you want to look at that in more detail, or you, th you have ideas of how to make this a little bit clearer, um, there's an ongoing sort of debate about, um, especially this covariance matrix argument, um, how that should be implemented or improved upon. So that's uh, CDIST.
There's a related, uh, very closely related function called pdist. Um, and this is mostly for, it's basically for distances within a given array. Um, but I, I often use cdist over pdist just because I find the return data structure a fair bit easier to work with. And I think you'll see what I mean um, if I show you an example. So we have this test array here, which I've just made up. So it has 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 2. Just so we can see how, in a very simple example, how the data structure gets returned when we want to get those distances. Um, so it returns a condensed distance matrix, um, which is basically the distance between this first point and the second point, the first point and the third point, and the second point and the third point. So if we just look at those distances, it makes sense, right? So 0, 0 to 0, 1 is 1. 0, 0 to 0, 2 is 2, and 0, 1 to 0, 2 is a distance of 1. So maybe that's, you think, okay, well, actually, you know, maybe I shouldn't have trouble dealing with that, but if you imagine a data set with 10,000 points or 100,000 points, sometimes thinking about ways to program with that data structure can be a little bit of a pain, because you have, you have to think about, right, because you have to think about where you are in this matrix relative to this matrix, as opposed to the return value from CDIS, where you just have all the rows representing the points in the first data set and all the columns representing the points in the second data set. Um, but fortunately, there's this um, scipy.spatial.distance.square form function, and that will actually convert between the two types. So if you use pdist and you decide, oh, you know, I should have used cdist, or you wanted to avoid the redundant matrix um, initially, but then you actually decide that you do need that larger, more straightforward matrix, you can actually just use the square form function take the input, and now you'll get the, the array that's maybe a little bit easier to deal with, right? So this is this point here on the top left is the distance between the first point in the first point in the data set and itself. So you're actually, you have a sort of redundant situation, but it's a little bit, at least for some people, it's a little bit easier to deal with this, with this distance matrix. Or maybe you prefer the other distance matrix and you can actually use square form to go back to that as well. Um, So that might be useful in, in certain cases. And this is just to show that if you were to use CDIST, you can actually go the other way as well. So produce the, the condensed distance matrix instead of the redundant by um, just using square form um, in between. And perhaps also worth noting that very recently, um, someone noticed that actually square form was converting all input to um, float64, so the double floating point data type. And some people didn't like that because they were, had very specific applications. So square form now as of SciPy 0.19 will respect um, the data type that you use for that operation. So a fairly minor detail, but um, just something that I noticed uh, working on SciPy. So I just I just thought I'd use a do a quick real world example with PDIST. Um, I guess this is sort of from my field. So you know, imagine that you have um, a situation where you have some kind of protein that's involved in human disease, and you want to know. Um, if it's sort of um, compacting or squishing in the disease state versus the, the, the healthy state. Um, so you want to know the closest distance between any two given points in that data set. And so I've just um, used random data for, for simplicity. So you have some protein, which is just a cloud of coordinates. Um, and if we use CDIST, the minimum distance is zero because it considers, it has a sort of redundant matrix where you have the distances between the points and themselves. Uh, but that won't happen in a PDIS contest, uh, PDIS context. Um, so if we look at the values that you get out of that, um, you'll see that the values are non-zero, which is more sensible. Um, but perhaps more critically, um, in certain applications, um, CDIS will also produce enormous, because it's a redundant matrix where you have all the points in the data set um, sort of multiplied by all the points in the data set again, um, you get these massive, massive distance matrices with CDIS sometimes. I, mean, I think I, here I've just compared with the values that I get from, from PDIS size. So they're a fair bit smaller. I think I just did a division here to show that um, the CDIS dot size here is about twice as big as the PDIS size. Um, so if you, can, if you can deal with the, the format of the distance matrix used by PDIS, there are probably some applications where you would indeed benefit from reducing your memory footprint by using PDIS over CDIS. And for absolutely enormous data sets, we, and we'll talk about this a bit later, we can also use um, binary space partitioning to avoid, um, to avoid having to calculate these large distance matrices at all. Um, but we'll cover that a bit later. Um, and once again, just for um, 
just for sanity reasons to show that actually we're, we're getting the same uh, matrix return values for this specific example. I just did an assertion to make sure that um, the, uh, the matrices from Cetus and Petus for this case are, are the same. Um, the other thing I haven't said too much about is that um, you can actually define your own custom functions for, for using with Cetus and Petus. Um, so if you have some fancy distance that isn't, some fancy distance matrix that, or metric that isn't available in the, the custom library, um, you may want to code that yourself. I mean, you may eventually want to submit it to, to SciPy, and I'm sure they'd appreciate it if it's something that's really useful. Um, but in the short term, you may just want to code it yourself and then use, um, use um, Cetus or Petus, and you can do that. Um, the only problem is that there's no easy way to feed in um, extra arguments. So if your distance function requires certain uh, parameters like covariance or something, I mean, covariance is already in there, but, um, but something related to covariance that's a little bit different, there's no super easy way to do that. And so that's... Um, there's an open pull request to actually allow people to add sort of arbitrary arguments and keyword arguments to, to either Cetus or Petus, which they've able to exodus there. Um, but there's a bit of contention about how it should be done or if it should be done. So if you have thoughts on that, then, then do feel free to, uh, to chime in on that, uh, on that pull request there. Um, so in a sense, so, so that's, that's looking at distances between um, sort of one array of data and another array of data. And I'm actually now going to move to what seems like a simpler topic, which is actually the distances between just single vectors of data. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is that once we do the numeric versions, which are fairly straightforward, I'm going to move on to um, some of the fancier Boolean distances. So um, basically arrays with just zeros and ones or twos and falses and do some, um, some sort of interesting things there. Um, so there are actually, so scipy.spatial to distance has many of the same functions that are available for pdis and cdis. And I mentioned before, you shouldn't use those, so you shouldn't provide those functions in, as arguments to pdis or cdis. Um, but if you're using, it would be overkill to use pdis or cdis for just single numeric vectors, so you're, you're certainly welcome to use um, the built-in distance functions for that. So by built-in distance functions, I just mean, so scipy.spatial.distance.euclidean. So don't provide that object to pdis or cdis if you're doing um, doing large distance matrix calculations, just use the string argument um, Euclidean, for example, or city block as another example. Um, so I'm just, we're just working with 1D arrays here. We've got a random data set. Just want to calculate, just very, very simply, this is incredibly simple, just calculate the Euclidean distance between two, um, two points. So you can do that that way. And again, not appropriate for multi-dimensional arrays. So if you have more than one row, it'll just it'll raise a value error there. And if we want to calculate the city block distance between two arrays, again, this should be fairly straightforward. Um, just to show it here, so city block distance, type height at spatial that distance dot city block, the two arrays of data. I've just plotted the data here just to make it clear what distance we're calculating. Um, so it's, you could also just picture this as a single step. So one big step to the right along the x-axis and then one single step all the way up to along the y-axis. That would be the same distance too, by the way. It's just the sum of all of these x values plus the sum of all of these y values, which is different from the straight line Euclidean distance. Um, so yeah, so I've made that note there. Um, and I think I just have a slightly more sophisticated example of distance between two, two points. So again, I just have a fairly simple case where we have two 1D vectors. And I think what I wanted to do here was just basically weight the distances just to show that you can actually apply a weight. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll stick with Euclidean distance just so it makes intuitive sense. And if we think about what this distance would roughly be, maybe it's about a dif difference of about one in the x direction and maybe about maybe nine in the y direction. So we'd expect a distance greater than nine as I've noted here. So if we apply a weight of basically 100% to the x vector, we're expecting the distances to be much less than the actual Euclidean distance, right? So you can see here the, here the result is one. So it's actually completely the x distance as you'd expect. So hopefully that makes sense. We've got p equals two for the Euclidean norm and the weight vector being 100% to the x-axis. So, um, so I guess that's a fairly obvious uh, result. Um, and then if we just, we just put a little bit of weight to the y value here, we can see that we're starting to increase the value and if we apply equal weight to each, we get, uh, yeah, we get basically, I think this is actually, this would actually be the Euclidean distance, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so I actually did that assertion there. So um, it's the same as the Euclidean distance down here. 
So maybe that's yeah, maybe that's not hugely surprising, but it's just useful to know that you you can do that sort of thing if you need to. Um, and yeah, so the the real reason I I wanted to go into these you know these relatively straightforward um, single vector to single vector distance computations um, was for these more interesting or potentially more interesting um, Boolean vectors, so true false vector data type comparisons, um, which can be used in all kinds of applications. Um, and the first one here, I think, is I have the Hamming distance here. And um, yeah, so I have this example here where, for example, CDs or DV DVDs that have scratches for the data, some have been damaged. Um, codes are used to store the data to give you, or to give the machinery a chance to sort of recover at least part of what information was lost. Um, so a lot of these Boolean comparisons are good for that, good for that sort of thing. And the Hamming distance is appropriate for long looking at the number of substitutions required to convert one data set to, to another. Um, and so if you have a lot, of, if you need a lot of conversions, then that might mean that, for example, this is a simplification, but that might mean that there's actually a fair bit of damage to the data. So you need, you need to know how much repair you have to do or how much information has to be converted in what way. Um, so I just have this example here. I have these, I've used um, the data type as um, NumPy Boolean just to convert these to true and false values, the zeros and ones. Um, and you notice the distance is actually not an integer value, which initially I thought was a bit confusing. So we, we've called Hamming on the original code word versus the recovered code word. And if we look at the number of differences, so there's one here, the zero and one. These are the same. Second difference here, right, the zero and one. And a third difference over here. So I was initially expecting the value to be three. But uh, but my understanding is yeah it's, it's actually the normalized Hamming distance you actually divide by actually the, the total number of uh, values in each in each data set so um, so I just did a, I just did a sort of equivalent comparison where I just looked at the indices that were different so that would give you an integer value divided by the total number of positions so it's just basically averaged over the total number of values in, in the given data set. So that is useful in some applications. That's definitely not like the full implementation of how you'd recover data from a scratched CD, of course. Um, but that's the sort of thing that you can do with the, with the Hamming distance. So, um, and I try to get made, make one or two examples with nice pictures. Um, we're still on the topic of um, so Boolean comparing two arrays with zeros and ones or two and false values. Um, so I've got this animal. I think this is an emperor, emperor penguin in the is it the Antarctic? I think it's the Antarctic. Um, and so we've got this image, and I think I'm using the Python pillow library to get some some information. So the pixel dimensions here of the yeah, so Emperor Penguin at the construction site. These are the pixel dimensions here. And so now I, I what I wanted to do was just make a very simple example of cutting out part of the picture. So I think I've got these sort of pixel positions in the x and y directions. And then this, the, the pillow library allows us to sort of crop out. This is crop method here to crop out the region. I'm certainly not an expert on this library, but I just thought I'd try to cut out that region. And so that's the region that I cut out as a sort of reference region. And now I want to basically define a reference matrix. And I think what this does is we basically go through the, so I basically set zeros to all the values in the original image and then set ones to the values that I cut out. So if we think of, you know, there are, of course, far more sophisticated methods for doing, uh, you know, machine learning methods and the sort of things for doing um, uh, visual analysis of images or recognition of parts of images. So I just wanted to have a way to very sort of very crudely look if, if we have the result of one of those more sophisticated algorithms, how good is that result in a very crude context that doesn't use really fancy things like machine learning. So I'm certainly not trying to replace those approaches, and this doesn't do that. Um, but this will tell us, it'll basically put ones in all, of the, um, in all of the parts of the original image that contain this little clipped out region, and then zeros in all the parts that, that do not contain that particular region. And so we have, yeah, so it's mostly false, right? Because this is actually just a very small part of the original image. So it makes sense that this small sample shows mostly false um, values. And yeah, so I've written here, so yeah, let, let's pretend that we have some other bounding boxes of the same size that were selected by, you know, very sophisticated computer vision routines. And we want to sort of very crudely identify the best approach. Um, so I've just basically defined 
um, somewhat arbitrarily. I just made sure that they had the same dimensions, um, different boundaries. So, um, so program one, program two, and program three, these would be sort of potentially very sophisticated machine learning approaches, which have perhaps slightly different pixel boundaries. And I can see the results of the, the data sets that they've pulled out. So one has most of the penguin, one has a very small part of the penguin, and the other seems to have pretty much none of the penguin. And so we look at this Jakarta distance metric, which you may have never heard of, but again, it's just a way that SciPy provides for calculating the distances between Boolean vectors. In this case, the Boolean vectors me meaning the, basically the true or false values for whether or not you contain pixels that are in the selected region, which maybe is a, a fairly obvious application in any case. But we see here the Jakarta distance is one, so it, it, which is um, a fair bit larger than the other two cases when there's no penguin in the image. If you have part of the penguin in the image, we have a slightly smaller Jacquard distance. And if we have almost the entire penguin in the picture, we have a much smaller Jacquard distance. So that's, maybe that's fairly obvious, but I just thought, think that's kind of a cool application of this particular um, distance within, within SciPy. Um, so certainly not a replacement, again, for these sort of sophisticated computer vision routines, but, but sometimes you might just want to have a way to check the results of your more, so more sophisticated pipeline using a very, very simple approach, and that's one of the ways to do it. Um, I just have a note here on how it, people actually normally use the Jacquard index, so you would have one minus the value so that a larger value would actually mean a better result. I've just used the built-in version from SciPy, but if you do work in the field, I think it is actually normal to do it where you subtract the value from one when you report it. Um, and typically values so I have greater than 0 0.5 are considered um, decent matches, um, if, that's useful to, if that's useful to know. Um, I think I've got one more of these cases, and I picked the sort of popular example. This is with the Yule distance now, so moving from Jacquard to Yule. Again, another way to look at these true or false distances, um, two arrays with zeros or ones or true and false values. Um, so the, the Yule distance, I think I, I found one example in literature where it was being used for looking at handwriting uh, similarity. And the literature example is far more complicated than what I'm going to do here. So I'm just going to show you a very, very straightforward example where the letters are roughly the same size and the white space is roughly in the same parts of the image and that sort of thing. Um, but we still have, so I just, I just have this handwritten um, letter T. And I'm just using this, the, pillow li the Python pillow library again just to get some very simple information. I think the pixel dimensions, and just to make sure that it's um, an RGB type type image. Um, and then I also have a computer, I think I just made this myself, a computer generated T from a, f a standard computer font. Um, and again, just getting the dimensions of the image. So I've, I've cooked it up so that they're the same size, so 225 by 224, the same type. Um, so I think you do want them to be the same, the same size for these comparisons. And I've also used the computer to generate an S of the same size. Um, just looking at the data structures a bit. So it's mostly white, so 255, 255, 255. I'm pretty sure that's white in RGB. Because um, most, most of the image is white space with just a few dark pixels for where the, where the, um, where the letter's actually written. And I just thought I'd um, yeah, basically just compare the, so where's my Yule? SciPy, that's spatial distance import Yule, handwritten T. Yeah, so right here, so I'm basically doing a Yule distance comparison between the computer-generated version of the, the Boolean array and that handwritten reference letter T. Um, so we're iterating over the S and the T relative to the handwritten version. And if we look at the computer S to the T, we get a fairly large yield distance. And if we look at the um, computer T to the handwritten T, we get a much smaller yield distance or dissimilarity. Um, so again, maybe that's fairly obvious. We're just looking at the, where the ones and zeros are, the dark and light parts of the image. And again, this definitely would not in any way replace the very sophisticated sort of computer vision type techniques that you'd use for looking at all kinds of different features um, for handwriting recognition. But maybe you just want a sanity check at the end of one of these really sophisticated workflows. Um, and this is, again, a, just a useful way to do some, a fairly simple check on that, on that sort of thing. Um, so that, that concludes the section on um, basically distances between points, whether they be distances in large arrays or distances in small arrays of x and y coordinates, um, and also looking at, uh, at Boolean arrays, or so that, for example, with these images and pixels and images, if they're a certain color or not. Um, I briefly alluded to earlier the idea that um, sometimes it's better to use PDIST than CDIST because you have an enormous 
um, set of data and you don't want to have a huge redundant matrix. Um, but sometimes even PDIS isn't enough and you, you just really want to avoid the physical memory cost of generating an absolutely enormous uh, distance matrix between all the points in your data set and another data set or just all the points in a given data set. Um, and so one way to deal with that particular situation, this is something I have to do a fair bit when I'm working with huge biological data sets, is to use um, a certain type of binary space partitioning. Um, often people will use KD trees, and we will go into the example of the scipy.spatial.kd tree. Um, but, um, but actually, because this was something I didn't know a whole lot about, I thought I'd just do a little bit of background on, on binary space partitioning as a sort of general concept initially. Um, the basic idea, as the name implies, you know, the binary portion of the name implies, is basically you just take your space and you start basically using planes to spit it into binary pieces. Um, so often, you'll, for example, you'll split along the x-axis and then the y-axis and then along the z-axis. You know, keep doing that over and over and over until your data is organized into this tree where the computer knows which points are sort of in certain regions and that allows the computer to figure out which neighbors are closer together or, or which are within a certain region of space and to search that space much more efficiently than it would if you were just doing a sort of very crude brute force distance comparison between all the points in the, in the data set. Um, and there's a lot of applications. Um, probably the most famous one is 3D computer graphics. So the screens that you're looking at right now and the screen that we see up there, um, the information and the, all the polygons are drawn um, typically using, a, it'll be a more sophisticated example of binary space partitioning than I'm going to, to talk about today, but um, at the end of the day, binary space partitioning does play an important role in how computer graphics are drawn. Um, so it's used in, in sort of games, in um, graphics, in collision detection, um, robotics, and ray tracing. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of very computer graphics focused applications. So I, I had, um, yeah, so this, the Wikipedia article is actually pretty good. I probably shouldn't be using Wikipedia in tutorial, but anyway, this is actually a pretty good article. Um, but I thought if I'm going to talk about it, I should know how it works. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try to code. Their, so they just have a static example, which shows how binary space partitioning worked. And I thought, okay, let's see if I can code this in Python. And you'll see how good or how bad I actually did. I think my code is way too long. Um, so maybe like the early, early computer monitors had code that was this bad. Um, but so basically, the idea, I think we can just look at sort of a few key points of the code. Um, let's see, what do we have here? Um, a lot of it's just plotting related because I wanted to show you how the algorithm works and in, in, in the plots. Um, but I do do some checks of the, these are just um, sort of like x2 minus x1, y2 minus y1, very sort of very straightforward slope calculations, straight line slope calculations to see if the x or y direction is changing more rapidly to decide where to put the partitioning line. So I'll just execute this cell. Let's look at the plot that comes out. Yeah, so, so the initial data set is just a set of lines. This is sort of borrowed from the, the nice example in the Wikipedia article. Um, so we have these lines labeled as A, B, C, and D. So if you kind of imagine that a computer monitor has to deal with like all kinds of different polygons, not just lines, but triangles and so on. But if we simplify a little bit and assume that you're just dealing with lines, how does the algorithm work? Um, and so I've got this node diagram over here which shows how the computer would sort of, um, in a simplified way, um, store this information to, to, to then retrieve it later on. Um, so just sort of arbitrarily picking A as the starting point, so this, this line A is the starting point, what the computer would typically do is basically divide the space into two regions. So there's the region above A, which I've colored as these blue lines here. Actually, yeah, you can see the colors, I guess. And then the red lines here are below A. And then so you, you basically sp split the space into those nodes. So A becomes the sort of parent node. And then all the nodes above A are put in a new node here. And all the nodes um, below A are put in a new node over here. And then you keep doing that for all of the other lines as well. So here we have, uh, for example, line. So we, now we're working with the lines that are just below uh, the line A. So we split these lines in two based on whether or not they're above or below. And so now we're just look, working with these red ones. So D2, B2, and C2, these are all below. So those are the ones I've transferred down here. And then we just pick one of those, and that becomes the new sort of head node. And then we look in front of that node. So there's actually nothing in front of D2 down here. And everything is behind, so B2 and C2. So those, goes into this, those go into this new node here. And the other node is basically empty. And then do the same thing for the lines on top. So D1, B1, and C1 are above the original A. So here they are, D1, B1, C1. And do the same sort of thing. So take line D1, use that as a reference. Look at what's in front of D1. 
what's behind D1, and assign the nodes accordingly. So now B1 and C1 are down here, and there's nothing on the other side, so that node is empty. And then do it again. So now we have, now we just have, so over here, remember, we had this line here, nothing in front of it, everything behind it. Now we just have B2 and C2. And now it's a very, very simple case. There's just C2, which is behind B2, and same thing for the lines that are on top. So even if the exact details are, it's probably not that confusing, it's just a very small number of lines, but even if the exact details are a little bit confusing, hopefully you can just see this, the idea that you draw this sort of dashed line on one of your polygons or one of your lines, you split the space into two parts, and you start building a tree that way. And because the computer can store this tree, it can retrieve information about neighbors and, and distances um, in a very efficient manner, and that is really useful for a lot of distance-based workflows. So hopefully, hopefully at least that is the, is the takeaway that um, is the takeaway that I was intending? Um, I have a few notes here just in the background. So there's this famous painter's algorithm, which is basically just at least how early monitors would draw the what you see on the screen. So you would draw the information from the back to the front, and you would use this this um, binary space partitioning approach to uh, to to assist the computer with with that particular process. Um, so the, yeah, so the other, so there's a few things to note. One is that the final number of lines is actually, or the final number of polygons will typically be a fair bit larger than the initial starting point, because you can see here, for example, in the first step, we doubled the number of lines by cutting the, the data set in half. Um, and uh, so there are, it, and it's also not, it's, it's normally not arbitrary which line or polygon you'd pick first. And so there's, so there's certain important considerations like the balancing of your tree. So you might want to have a really balanced tree in some applications. In other applications, you might have um, a desire to have one branch of the tree um, be more dense than another. And I don't know all the idiosyncrasies of those particular, um, those particular cases, but it's just useful to know that, um, that often you want a balanced tree, but not always. Um, and so the... And the main thing, in, the main implementation in SciPy is, is these KD trees, which is the focus of the next section. Um, and that's basically a specialized application of binary space partitioning. So I just thought I'd show a, a very general example and sort of classical graphics, computer graphics example. Um, but what most people will use this for is typically um, distance comparisons, distance calculations when you're trying to avoid uh, really large distance matrices or you're trying to do really fast calculations with large, which large data sets. So any questions or concerns? Or let's get some water. So yeah, so typically these KD trees, which is short for k-dimensional trees, so this, this typically works well um, up to maybe three or four dimensions, but as you go to really high dimensional data, um, there is the drawback, of sort of, and I think I've written in bold here, the curse of dimensionality. So if you have a huge data set, which is also in a huge number of dimensions, then you definitely have a challenging problem. And KD trees may not be really much better, if at all, um, compared to a brute force uh, comparison of all the distances or all the points in each in each matrix that you're you're comparing. Um, but a lot of cases do happen in Euclidean like three um, D space, and so it's useful to have KD trees for those applications. Um, and I think there's a sort of a rule of thumb where you typically want um, the number of data points to substantially exceed um, the number of dimensions in your data set, uh, which is maybe just common sense in any case. But, um, but there is an equation for that. I don't think I've written it here, but there is an equation um, if you want to get a more quantitative analysis of whether or not you should bother with KD trees. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so KD trees, there's actually several ways to build them. Um, and you typically, I just noted here, you, t you do typically cut along the axes or orthogonal to the axes in order. So you would alternate between cutting along X and Y and Z, as I alluded to earlier. And then you go back to the X and then the back to the Y and back to the Z. So you cut the, you might cut your 3D space using planes that are orthogonal to each other over and over and over until you've done the, the tree construction process. Um, but you don't really have to worry about that too much because that's implemented under the hood in, in, in SciPy that's spatial. Um, so I've cooked up an example here. What have I written? So consider an autonomous vehicle or robots moving through space with a dense set of obstacles. I think it's actually a really dense set of obstacles. Um, and then, so let's explore the various ways that KD trees may be used to probe um, the obstacles in this, in this space. Um, and I'm again using just random, random data uh, just to, to simplify the, uh, the example and not require any super um, complicated or dependency related input. Um, so I'm just gonna plot the data initially. So the vehicles are these large blue, I think this is quite a large data set, so it might take a few seconds to plot. 
I did have a reason for for picking these unusually large data sets, which is that you actually need um, as a modern computers, you need a fairly large data set to show the power of KD tree over, for example, a conventional distance matrix approach. Um, so the obstacles are so dense that they're pretty much everywhere, and then the vehicles are these sort of blue dots which are hidden under the obstacles. Um, so I'm just going to do a few benchmarks here. Um, I'm not sure we want to wait 45 seconds, but okay, we'll, we'll do it anyway. Um, hopefully it doesn't crash any of your computers either. Did it do crash anyone's computer? Hopefully not. Okay. That's good. Um, so I want. So the problem is to find the closest, the 20 closest pairs of points um, between all of the vehicle coordinates and all the obstacle coordinates. Um, so maybe you have like a huge mapping system with information on autonomous vehicles and all the obstructions they have to deal with, and you want to know that sort of the 20 worst cases at any given point in time. What are the 20 most critical distances between a vehicle and an obstacle? Um, so here I'm using CDIST to calculate brute force, the, di the distance between all of the vehicle coordinates and all of the obstacle coordinates, um, and basically iterating very crudely in Python over, the, over each of the vehicles in that distance matrix. So yeah, it took 48 seconds. Um, that's pretty slow. Um, and now I'm going to try using KD tree. I mean, you can see the result from when I executed it before, but let's just do it here so you believe me. So that's a fair bit faster, right? I had less time to talk to. So two seconds as opposed to 48. Um, so just using, you just, you just take your, your obstacle coordinates and feed those into KD tree right there. And then we use tree.query, this query method, where the query values are the vehicle coordinates. And um, we want to find K being the 20 closest neighbors. And I had to index that to the, um, to the second value. So it returns some other, other information as well, so I had to index it there. Um, but that was just, so KD tree, as I wrote it here, with the capital KDT here, like that, that's actually a pure Python implementation of KD tree. And it turns out that more recently, um, that's effectively been superseded by an optimized um, C slash Cython implementation, um, which should be faster. I'll execute it here just to see if it's, yeah, so that was really fast, right? So it's um, 580 milliseconds for the exact same calculation, right? The same input, the same query, the vehicle coordinates, the obstacles. Um, so yeah, that's something to th think about, right? If you have these huge data sets and you want to calculate closest neighbors, you may actually want to use KD tree over distance matrix. Um, and there's actually a way to make it even faster. And this is really common in robotics, is that you don't need the exact distance. You just want the approximate closest distance or the closest neighbors. Um, so this is extra thing here. This, so I got the K for the 20 nearest neighbors, but there's also this EPS, which is for um, basically the acceptable threshold if you're doing an approximation. So I think 0.5 means that you take one plus the value of EPS. You're allowed to have 1.5 times the true, um, the true distance threshold. So you're looking for the roughly approximate closest neighbor. So it's not exact, but sometimes it's faster. Let's see. So it's a little bit faster. And to be honest, I think sometimes if, you, if I execute enough time, sometimes it'll actually be a little bit slower. So it depends on your particular case. But in this case, it looks just a little bit faster than, um, than the, the, the CKD tree without the approximation. So maybe if you have like real world scenarios where you need like really fast reaction times, you may actually benefit from a super fast approximate um, usage, of, usage of KD tree. But in a lot of cases where you don't have huge data sets, sometimes KD tree isn't really worth the hassle. And I did actually have to, you can sort of tell from this example, I kind of had to cook it up. So I have a lot of vehicles, a ridiculous number of obstacles. So I did have to cook that scenario up pretty well to make it look like KD tree was, was doing better than distance matrices. So you do need a, um, you often need a very specific application scenario for KD tree to be worth your time. Um, but there certainly are cases where that would be, where that would be very useful. So if you have questions, I'm happy to, happy to handle. The output from, yeah, so these should all have exactly the same value. Yeah, so it's, it, it would, you should get the, um, the neighbor values. So if we just go to the KD tree in the docs, let's go to CKD tree. And it has all these different methods. I think we were using query. Um, so X is, a, this is the array-like input, which was the, the vehicle coordinates I was putting in. And then it tells you what it returns. So these are the, the D is the distances. And then this is the array of, of ints for the locations of the nearest neighbors. Um, so hopefully that, um, 
I think there's some examples here too. Um, so hopefully, that, does that make sense? Yeah, um, but yeah it should be well documented. Um, but yeah, it's just, the, just this extra EPS thing. I think they just describe it in a similar way. So yeah, so return the approximate nearest neighbors and, uh, and that you have one plus EPS times the distance of the real of the truth. So it's an approximation and you can decide how approximate it's allowed to be, basically. Oops. Okay, so so now I'm going to move to um, some of the sort of classic computational geometry concepts and algorithms, and that's basically convex hulls, Delaunay triangulations, and Voronoi diagrams. Um, so those are very sort of classic computational geometry concepts. I think our break's in about 20 minutes, so I'll, at least I'll start into convex hulls. Um, and convex hulls, if you take an algorithms class, Actually, I haven't, but I, I hear that if you take an algorithms class, um, convex halls are one of the main things that you'll study in a, um, a sort of time complexity analysis scenario. You want to know like how an algorithm performs. Convex hall is a really classic example of something that you might study um, in that particular field. Um, but if in, an, in a lot of applications, if you're doing computational geometry, one of the first steps is to calculate the convex hall. So it's important to know uh, what the convex hall is, at least. Um, in a fairly simple, um, fairly simple definition context. Um, I've also mentioned general position here. So when you're doing computational geometry, um, a lot of the time you have to think a little bit about your input. Um, so if you're working with random data sets, actually that's often a fair bit easier. So if you randomly generate data, the chances of something being pathological are usually pretty low from a computational geometry standpoint. But real world data sets don't have that same property. So you might have, for example, repeated data points, so degenerate data. And that can cause issues with, uh, with certain algorithms. Um, so sometimes libraries will be written in such a way that it'll just filter out that, that extraneous data. So you might have data that is, you have three of the same data point and it'll just filter that out for you. Um, but in other cases, you might have to think a little bit more carefully or pre-filter your data. Um, if you have, for example, seven points that lie on a straight, that lie on a straight line, that can sometimes cause issues for computational geometry algorithms. So it's just useful to know that. So if you're, if you're ever working with some sort of hardcore computational geometry workflow and something isn't going on or something isn't really making sense, you're not sure what's going on, it's probably worth your time to make sure that there's nothing pathological about your input data before you go too much farther. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so convex halls, in, in it, one of the things that we maybe want to understand before we talk about convex halls is just what a convex region actually is. I think most people sort of intuitively know what that is, um, but the sort of relatively straightforward definition is just that any two points in a convex shape, basically, they can see each other without drawing a line through the edge of the data set. Um, so the convex hull is the intersection of all the different convex uh, sets that surround a, a point set. Um, so in theory, there would be a sort of an infinite number of convex regions that you could draw around a data set. So if you picture any data set, any point of clouds, or so any point cloud, and you just draw a circle around that, and you just keep increasing the radius of that circle or that roughly circular object, that's basically effectively a convex region that's covering your data set. So you can imagine there's an infinite number of those that you can, you can come up with, um, but the smallest one that completely bounds your set is the convex hull. So these are kindergarten geoboards. This is an image of a kindergarten geoboard. And the analogy that's almost always used in the literature for convex hull is you basically have a set of nails or a set of screws in a board. You take an elastic band and you wrap that around your data set. And that's the convex hull in two dimensions. So it sort of tightly wraps your data set. And it always includes points on the, sort of on the, on the border of your data set. Um, and so that's really useful for getting boundaries and for getting paths around obstacles and all kinds of applications of that nature. And a lot of things start off with the convex hull. A lot of algorithms use convex hull as the starting point under the hood. And we can calculate conveniently using the SciPy at Spatial Library um, using this convex hull class right here. So SciPy at Spatial the convex hull. Um, it's perhaps also worth noting that um, so so a lot of the computational geometry uh, functionality in SciPy actually comes from another library called QHull, which is one of the sort of two or three really big um, computational geometry libraries that are available out there. It's written really fast. I think it's written in C. There's a competitor library called CGAL, which is also really well known. So these are two really sort of solid C-level libraries that work really, really fast. 
And so I think the the SciPy developers didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so they, they took that really good code and put that under the hood, and it's just exposed for, for our convenience within SciPy.spatial. Um, so that's what you're actually using when you call SciPy.spatial the convex hull. And if you're doing something really fancy, you can actually specify flags that go into the C code, and that'll control what QHull is doing. Um, but normally, at least when I use it, I usually can just get away with calling it like this and generating an instance of the, the hull object like that. So I have a random array of data here, 35 rows and two columns. You can see it down here. I think it'll be different every time because I haven't fixed the seed, I don't think. But um, we, can basically, we can basically plot this data very easily. Again, convex hull is such a fundamental concept that the developers actually decided to add in a built-in plotting routine to SciPy.spatial. So you can just take this object that you generate, this hull object that you generate by calling convex hull, and feed that into this function. SciPy to spatial the comics hub plot 2D, feed the whole object right in there, and that'll save you the effort of having to do all the boilerplate code in Python. So if you just want to get a quick idea of what the convex hub looks like, um, you can just do this right away. And, um, and uh, you can see that this looks pretty much like the, the definition that I've described. It's like an elastic band that wraps around the data set. It goes through many of the points that are along the edge of the data set. But it does have the prerequisite of general position. So if you imagine a case where, say, um, there were three or four points that, that were on exactly on this line at the top here. How would you decide which of those points the line should go through? So that's sort of a tricky issue. Um, so I, I've noted here this general position prerequisite, and I've actually intentionally generated a data set with, it should have some redundant points, I think. Let's see, degenerate vertices, three, one, maybe the other way. Yeah, so I, what I thought I would put um, duplicate points. What I actually do is I put points on the same line, right? So these have the same x value, or sorry, the different x values but the same y value, where you see they, they have um, points that share y values, points that share, sorry, points that share y values and points that share x values. So this could potentially cause issues. Um, so I just plotted that data here. It turns out that if you feed that into convex hull and scipy at spatial, that will actually work without complaining. Um, and that's because QHull is actually or is smart enough, per se, that it will actually filter out those degenerate points when it's doing the analysis. And you can actually feed in specific QHull options. This one here is called QC, for whatever reason. And that will actually give you information. I don't actually know exactly how it's formatted, but you can see it right here. This gives you information about the degenerate data in your data set. Um, so it'll tell you information about the indices and the, the neighbors for points that are degenerate. So I think the important point there is just that actually sometimes it, you'll get silent success even if your input data is degenerate. Um, so it, just because you get a result from scipy.spatial.convex hull um, doesn't mean that you don't have degenerate information in your input data. It just means that Q hull under the hood is actually gracefully handling that information and just doing the work for you silently. So I think some people might actually prefer um, explicit, like a failure if you have to generate data, but that's how QHall um, tends to work. Um, so yeah, I, I just have a, a little aside here on, on algorithm time and space complexities. Um, if you're like me and you don't have a formal computer science background, um, you may just sort of end up Googling this stuff and it's just useful to have an aside as to, um, and many of these algorithms are a bit, are quite involved, so it's useful to know how long it takes to run them. And uh, if you're building a sort of workflow, you want to know what's the bottleneck and that sort of thing. And there's a, there's a terminology that's used for describing that, uh, that uh, the amount of time that the algorithm takes. Um, and that's the big O notation. And many of you have probably seen this before, but maybe some of you haven't. Um, so you have this big O, and then you have a function after the big O. Um, and the function is usually a function of n, which is the number of input points or generators in your data set. Um, so if the function grows really quickly with n, that's typically an inefficient algorithm. It takes a really long time to run. Um, so it's useful to know, for example, if you have a quadratic algorithm, that's going to be slower typically than a log linear algorithm um, because it grows as the square of the input as opposed to n times the log of n. Um, something like um, just adding two numbers together is really, really fast. That's a constant time, uh, constant algorithm like that. Something really slow might be polynomial. Um, so it's, it's basically the number of input data points to the power of some exponential value. 
Um, so the, this is something that, um, and when I'm contributing something to Snipe Out at Spatial, it's one of the, the major things I have to worry about. Are people actually going to be able to use this for a wide range of data sets? And what are the, the limitations? When, when does it become sort of outrageously slow? At what data point um, size does it become outrageously slow? Um, so I'm mostly just going to talk about time complexity today. Um, but there are some cases where you actually have to worry about something called space complexity, which as the name implies is basically the amount of physical memory, the amount of RAM that the process, um, that the algorithm requires. And certainly when I'm writing an algorithm, like a computational geography algorithm in the early stages, I'll often have the space complexity is just not particularly good. And, you know, I'll crash my computer, for example. Um, and I've actually contributed code to SciPy that has bad space complexity, and then people have complained, and I've had to fix it. So I'll actually tell you about that a little bit later when we get into to Warner diagrams. So it's something to look out for, um, and you can just sort of look at the look at, for example, the shapes of the matrices that you produce in your algorithm. So you might have like if you have two million rows in a certain certain part with a certain input, um, that's something you might want to note and try to find a way to to make it more efficient. Um, so just just so that it's not jargon, in case any of you. Um, haven't heard of that. I may occasionally mention um, log linear. Log linear is certainly very common and very efficient time complexity, and quadratic is also quite common in, in computational geometry algorithms, but it's a bit slower. Um, so I will talk about those two a little bit. So just so you know what I'm talking about, uh, and log linear is, is, the, is the sort of worst case optimal performance for sorting. And sorting obviously being a very fundamental um, algorithmic concept in, in computer science. Um, so I just thought, um, this is something I did last year too, so I just thought we'd sort of empirically test. I think experienced algorithm sort of gurus can, can actually just look at the source code and, and they can actually just basically um, sort of figure out from first principles what the time complexity is because you can sort of say, well, all of the data points are compared with all the data points, so this particular step is quadratic. Um, but sometimes it's actually a little bit more complicated that, that, than that. Um, and what I thought would be easiest is just to do an uh, empirical test. So we just take a whole bunch of different data inputs, so like a thousand points up to, I think this is a million, right? One, yeah, one million. Um, and just see how much of time it takes for that to run and then plot the, plot the result. Um, so just benchmarking, it's already done. Okay, so convex hull, this is a really efficient implementation, so it, it did all the way up to a million points um, in less than a second for all of those different inputs. And I'm just going to plot the results, and I might have ran the bunch. Okay, so actually, yeah. So here we go. So I and I've just used these different fitting functions. So I've got a, a linear function, a log linear, and a quadratic, and I'm just using those to fit the data to show what is the most likely um, empirical time complexity for the data. It's probably not quadratic, right? So we see that the points, the actual points we get from execution, are either on the linear or the log linear line. And okay, it's, it's theoretically impossible for it to be linear, so it must be log linear. And that pretty much means that the, the Python scientific community can't really approve too much on this algorithm. It's basically already the optimized version. So the, the QHAL developers have done a really good job of implementing the algorithm, and that's working really, really well. So log linear is the theoretical limit. And I think I've just, so here I've just highlighted um, some of the different algorithms for convex halls. Um, so we have a, a few different paradigms, and these are the time complexities. Um, it's actually fairly common to have quadratic implementations just because a lot of the time um, it's a lot easier to implement the slower version of the algorithm. And sometimes it'll just work faster because the other, the log linear version, even though it's theoretically faster, just has so many steps and it's so complicated that actually getting it to run quickly is a bit of a pain. Um, so you certainly, you probably already have used code that is using theoretically not the optimal algorithm, but is just really convenient to implement, and, and that's why it's, it is that way. Um, so the, actually, the incremental convex hall algorithm is actually, even today, still um, often implemented because of its conceptual simplicity. Um, there's another one called gift wrapping, which is really, really, um, actually that one's, I can probably even just explain it using words. So if you, if you go up to our convex hall, um, so the way gift wrapping work is you, you, you basically pick you start off with a point that has the largest x coordinate and the smallest y coordinate, so the bottom right um, case here. This is a little bit tricky because there's actually um, degenerate data. Um, so you might actually have to rotate your data when you're doing that initial operation. But if you imagine that we start off in the bottom right here with this point here, what GIF wrapping does is it calculates the angle between this point here that you start with and all of the other points in the data set. And it looks for the point that has the largest angle from the horizontal. So that's, 
So you look, the, this angle here, what, what do you think that would be? Maybe 45 degrees, and what would this one here be? Maybe 70 degrees? This one here maybe what, say 55 or 60 degrees? But the line from this line to this line, that's almost 90 degrees, right? So you pick the largest, the largest angle to another point, and you continue this sort of so-called gift wrapping in that fashion. So now you use this point, and you calculate all of the angles to the other points, and all of these would be sort of negative angles, and then this would be the largest positive angle, or this one here would be the largest positive angle. You would draw the line to that one, and then you would repeat the process for all of the points as you go around like that. So that, that's conceptually, I'm just picking that one because it's easy for me to explain. The other ones are, can sometimes be a little bit more annoying to explain using just words. Um, but that's just an example of, um, of how fairly straightforward geometric intuition can actually lead to a very useful algorithm. And that's actually more efficient than, than the, um, the incremental algorithm in some cases. It actually depends on how many points are on the hull. So it's a sort of output dependent algorithm where you, ha you, you actually have to um, look at how many points lie on the hull um, to determine how long it takes. And then the other thing to think about is if you're working with multi-dimensional data, sometimes an algorithm that works really well in a small number of dimensions doesn't work as well in a larger number of dimensions. So that's why some of these other algorithms are mentioned here. So GramScan is, and this was, this was actually arguably the first paper in computational geometry. So it was published by, I think it was Ron, Ron Graham at Bell Labs in the, the early 70s, I think 1972. Um, he was working on that problem in the late 60s and published in, in the early 70s. But unfortunately, his approach didn't work in three dimensions. At least nobody's managed to extend it to three dimensions yet. So it's a sort of open problem. Um, but people have mentioned to have managed to extend divide and conquer, which is an also another important algorithmic concept. I won't cover that one because it's a lot harder to, to sort of wrap your brain around. But basically, that works in both 2D and 3D. Um, so there's there's reasons for there's reasons for developing other algorithms that work in, in higher dimensions. Um, and as I've mentioned, um, the Python community can't do better than, than Cybot at Spatial Convex Hall. Um, and this is just a nice example inspired by the, um, so the textbook I mentioned earlier just shows very nicely how you determine what the sort of theoretical op theoretically optimal speed for an algorithm is. Um, so if we picture a really simple example of trying to calculate a convex hull, in this case it's for a parabolic data set, so it just, this is y equals x squared, right? So each of these values is the square of the x value, so it just rises parabolically like this. Um, the problem of generating the convex hull here is the problem of sorting, this has been reduced to the problem of sorting the data points, if you can agree on that with me. So once, once the computer knows, I mean, it's very easy to do this visually, but it, the computer doesn't have that vision, so it has to sort these points out. And once the computer sorts the points out, then it has the convex hull. Um, but sorting, the time complexity of sorting, as I mentioned earlier, is n log n, it's log linear. And so because we have log linear performance for the algorithm in scipot at spatial, that convex hull, we are at the theoretical limit. So there's really not a whole lot we can do beyond that. And it turns out that actually, and this is within the last 30 years or so, that even if you didn't need to know the ordering of the points in the convex hull, so imagine that you just wanted to know, you had a huge data set, and you just wanted to pick out which points were on the convex hull without their order, it turns out that even that is still bounded by this limit. So in 1985, they published that paper, and that basically, and I won't tell you how they did that, because I don't actually know, but they basically proved that even with um, the requirement that you only want to identify which points are on the hall with other order, you're still bounded by the log linear time complexity. So what, what Sciopod at Spatial the Convex Hall is doing now is indeed uh, formally the best that it can possibly do. Um, so maybe um, we'll take the break now, because it's about 10.15, and then we'll, um, is it a 10 minute break? What does it say? Yeah, I think it's about a 10-minute break, and then we'll reconvene, if that's all right. <laughs>
end. Um, so we just left off with uh, just with this sort of uh, informal proof that um, the convex hull is effectively optimized to the theoretical limit. Um, and now I thought we, we, it would make sense to do a few practical examples, um, just seeing, seeing as convex hull is so fundamental in computational geometry. Um, so starting off with a, an example in two dimensions, and then, and then we'll, we'll work up to a three-dimensional example as well. Um, it's just the, it's the same function for both, for both dimensionalities. Um, but it's a little bit easier to start off with a two-dimensional case. Um, so I've cooked up another example. This is an example I used last year, too, where you have some kind of um, robot or autonomous vehicle that's trying to go around the state of Oregon, basically, um, get from, getting from one, one side to the, to the extreme other side. And we want to figure out the, the sort of minimum distance that the, the robot or vehicle can travel um, without actually going into the, the area of the state, so just going along the, the outside. Um, so, I mean, w one obvious approach would just be to follow the, the coordinates of the perimeter of the state. Um, but, but it turns out that actually, and this is often used in collision or sort of uh, obstruction avoidance, is that the most efficient route around the obstruction is actually um, defined by, by the, the, the route of the convex hull around the, the border of the, of the object. Um, so I've just, I've just read in some, um, some mapping data, for, for, which is just a, a NumPy array of coordinates for the state of Oregon. And um, what we're going to do is we're just going to, as we did before, just generate an instance of convex hull. So hull equals psi pi dot spatial dot convex hull. And we're just going to read in the, the, the x and y coordinates for the vertices of Oregon. Um, and again, we have the built-in convenience function, so we can just plot the data right away. And these red points are just where I've um, just highlighted the, the minimum and maximum um, x-coordinates. So these are the points that we want to travel between, the, the point that's farthest west in Oregon to the point that, that's farthest to the east, farthest to the right. Um, so now I just have I hold all this um, sort of boilerplate plotting code here, which you don't have to worry about too, too much. Um, and it's just worth noting that um, a lot of the data is accessed using sort of indices. So we have the, the points, and then we have the indices of the, the, the vertices. So these are the indices of the points that are on the vertices of the hull. So we need to access the data. This is, this is the typical thing that you'll do when, when handling the convex hull data. Um, and then, um, so if we look at the different paths, and I've, just, I've written a bit of code here to, um, to basically just to calculate the distances between um, all the points and the different paths. Um, and I just plotted those above the, the different plots. So I have, um, these are the two paths that just follow the border. So if we didn't know anything about this convex hull approach and we were just sort of naively trying to plot a path along the border of the state, there's two options, right? We can sort of head north first or head south first. Um, and both of those have values around 12, one's 12.3 and one's 12.0. Um, and then, I mean, right away, you can see the distances for the two hull paths which look different, right? So these are these are convex halls which contain all of the the data points. Again, this, this is like the elastic band analogy. So we're just wrapping an elastic band around the entire state of Oregon, and then following the path of that elastic band. Um, so you might in initially intuitively think that that would be longer, but actually, it's um, both of the paths are shorter, and we can see that one is 11.1, .1 and the other is 11.6. Um, so that that is actually those are. Um, that is one of the classic ways to figure out the minimum distance around an obstacle. Um, so, um, so in, in this case, it, you go, going north first is the fastest route around, is the fastest route around Oregon. So, so that's just a, sort of a cute little example of, of how you can use convex hull to do something actually pretty useful. Um, and I think the next example, the next example I have down here is 3D. Um, so this actually comes out of my own research. In case you're curious, what I what I use computational geometry for. So again, I'm just going to load in some coordinates here. This is coordinates for um, a single influenza virus. So if someone is sick with the flu and they cough or sneeze, um, they would produce millions of particles that look like this, this sphere here. Um, that's an influenza virus set of coordinates. And we're just going to read those in and uh, just plot them initially. Hopefully, I guess there's a lot of data points. Yeah, a lot of data points. There's three dimensions, x, y, and z coordinates. Um, and um, and so now, um, yeah, so, so the, the problem I'm proposing is how do we calculate, for example, the, at least estimate the surface area of this sphere? 
Um, and obviously this isn't something that's um, an application that's isolated to my field, because if you're looking at, say, a planet in astrophysics or um, a map on the surface of a sphere, you might want to know its total surface area. So I think it's a broadly applicable um, scenario. Um, so, so one way to go about that surface area, surface area calculation is to, to plot the convex hull, the 3D convex hull. So in this case, instead of having um, the border being uh, lines around a data set, it's basically basically faces. So you you take your three di three dimensional point cloud and you have triangles that surround that that point cloud, and so the triangles are really small because there's so many points, and they all, they basically completely cover the uh, completely cover the sphere. Um, so instead of the elastic bag uh, the elastic band analogy, we now have sort of like a, a big plastic bag that's covering the entire the entire data set that that that's in our input. Um, we call it uh, we call it the same way. So I just feed the three D three D data into a convex hull again to generate an instance of the convex hull object, which I've called flu um, flu hull here. And then, as I mentioned, we're now dealing with triangles. So we take the take the points, and then we, we find the indices of the simplices, so the triangles um, on the convex hull. And then I just plot those using matplotlib down down below. Um, and as it turns out. Um, there's actually a built-in area method for, for convex hull. I'll just go over to the documentation here for, for convex hull so we can take a look. Um, so convex hull, which is right here. And if you go down, they have an example of the plotting as well. But you can see that there's both area and volume attributes for convex hull. So it's quite convenient if you need to calculate the area or the volume of, the volume of an object in, inside pi.spatial. Um, so I've calculated the, the area that way. Um, and then I, I basically also just in a very crude, um, just taking the equation of a of a sphere and calculated its uh, its uh, surface area using four pi times the radius square just to see how they would compare, and then calculated the percentage that we reconstitute. So if you take all of those triangles on the surface and sum together all of their surface areas, how does that compare to the theoretical surface area of a sphere of that radius? Um, so we get about a ninety seven percent reconstitution. Um, and I would say that's pretty good, given that this object isn't a perfect sphere. So nature doesn't make these perfect spheres. They're actually a, a little bit, uh, a little bit flexible. So not not perfectly spherical. Um, so that's um, that's one sort of useful application of of, of the convex hull, and uh, and something that I do quite quite r routinely, um, using scipy at spatial. Um, so now we're going to move into. Um, the next of the sort of three fundamental concepts in computational geometry, which is triangulations, and specifically um, the Delaunay triangulation, uh, which is named after a Russian mathematician, Boris Delaunay. The key was actually a student of Voronoi, so if you've heard of Voronoi diagrams, which is the next section, um, Delaunay was, was a PhD student of Voronoi's, and, uh, and Voronoi diagrams and Delaunay triangulations are sort of really um, Really closely related, they're mathematical duals of each other. So if you have one, one of these data structures, you can often generate the other without too much trouble. Um, so in terms of what the Delaunay triangulation actually is, or it, maybe I should start off with what a, a triangulation is actually, um, and, and it's effectively just the maximum number of points that connects, uh, so the maximum number of edges that connects all the points in your data set. So you don't even have to use the word triangle to define triangulation. It just turns out that you do get a set of triangles when you draw all of those lines. Um, the only rule is that none of the lines that you draw between the points in your data set are allowed to cross each other. So it's the maximum number of non-intersecting edges that connect the points in your data set. Um, and the Delaunay triangulation is um, it's a specialized type of triangulation. Um, so it's still the maximum number of points, that, the maximum number of edges that connect your points. Um, but in this case, it, it has what it, only what are called uh, legal edges, or edges that avoid um, really small tri really small angles. And um, yeah, so the, the textbook example is an application case is for terrain reconstruction. So if any of you work in GIS, for example, if you've ever seen these sort of topographical maps where you have like these mountain ridges and these valleys, and you can almost, almost sort of move your finger over these maps. Um, those maps are based on a limited set of actual data, and then the rest is interpolated or, or extrapolated, and, and that's, well, interpolated using, um, usually using a Delaunay triangulation. So that's the sort of um, the most popular way and the most effective way to do it. Um, so that, that's definitely a really useful application of Delaunay triangulations. Um, and I, I think I just have a nice, a nice example here where um, we have, 
um, an example that has a legal edge and an example that has an illegal edge. So you, you see this, this edge between seven and eight? So if we assume that these are data points on a topographical map, um, seven and eight um, here are connected by this edge. And here, this edge has been flipped. So you call this edge flipping. So you take this line here, and you flip it so that it connects these lines here. So it's a different triangulation of the same data set. Um, the problem with this triangulation on the right side here is that we actually have um, small angles here and here and here and here. So the Delaunay triangulation always tries to avoid small angles, really small angles. So this one here would be a legal edge, and this would be a legal. Um, so it, it turns out that actually if you had any given sort of arbitrary triangulation to start with and you didn't know that it was a Delaunay triangulation, there are some computational algorithms that will actually take that triangulation and it'll just do what we did here manually um, in an automated fashion. So it'll just look at the angles and then it'll flip the edge and see if the angles got bigger. So if we go from this one to this one, the angles get bigger. Um, so the computer says, okay, so I'm moving in the right direction. And that will actually converge. So you can actually flip all the edges in that manner until you get to the Delaunay triangulation. So that's a valid algorithm for calculating the Delaunay triangulation. Um, so informally, the definition of Delaunay triangulation is that it's the fattest possible triangulation. It avoids, uh, it avoids skinny triangles. And once you avoid all of the skinny triangles in that manner and get to the final Delaunay triangulation, that's usually the most effective way to generate the topographical maps, for example. Um, Yeah, so, but this algorithm that I've mentioned, so the, the edge flipping, the brute force edge flipping is not the most efficient, so it's, it's quadratic, um, and it can't be extended to, to 3D cases. Um, but it's still, it's a very in, sort of geometric, it's consistent with the geometric intuition, I suppose, so it's really easy to explain. So that's why I picked that particular, um, pick that particular example. Um, there's another, so that's one way to define it, as, so the line triangulation avoids um, really skinny triangles. Um, but another way to define it is in terms of this, um, this thing called the empty circle property. So yeah, so none of the original data points can fall within the circumcircle of a triangle in the Delaunay triangulation. So I think I've just got a random, I just again, working with a random data set here. I'm just gonna plot the Delaunay triangulation. Um, and just for clarity, so it's, the call signatures, we've tried to be consistent in scipy.spatial, so you just call it again as scipy.spatial this time using Delaunay instead of convex hull here. Feed in your data set, and you generate an instance of this class, which then has various uh, methods and attributes that you can work with when you're doing your data analysis. Um, we can use matplotlib to, to plot the triangulation using triplot here. Um, and then I just wanted to emphasize the empty circle property. I think I've imported some of my own code here because it's a bit of a pain to plot the, the circles. Um, but you've got a copy of that library if you're running the code in your machine anyway. Um, so if we look at all the gray circles here, it might take a second or two for your eyes to adjust, but I think you'll believe me that none of the, the original data points, which are the green dots connected by the, the edges of the triangulation, so you can see all the triangles in the triangulation, right? But none of these circles actually contain a data point in the original data set, believe it or not, right? So they all just lie on the, lie on the edge. Um, so that's another way and a really useful way to, to define the Delaunay triangulation. Um, and one of the reasons that's useful is that if you calculate the centers of these circumcircles and connect them together, that's the Voronoi diagram. So that's a really powerful component of the definition of a Delaunay triangulation. Um, so, and that's why they're, cons they're considered mathematical duals of each other. Um, so that's a really important property. I keep typing in these cells. Okay. So let's go down to practical applications. So one of the things I mentioned at the start of the talk was this problem of um, you know, you're, you're building a network with nodes and you want to connect them with really expensive wiring of some sort. Um, it's expensive for whatever reason and you want to reduce the cost of, of building the network. Um, now, You'd, you'd almost be out of luck if you wanted to do this in automated fashion if you wanted redundant connections. So if you wanted to have the, the basically the triangulation that minimizes the, the total weight of all the, all the edges. Um, so that's actually an NP-hard problem. So I don't know how to solve it. Um, <laughs> uh, I certainly don't know how to solve it. Um, but if you just needed to connect each node once, so as long as it's possible to have a complete network, so one in which it's possible to get from one point to another by following some path, any path, 
Um, that problem you can solve analytically in a reasonable amount of time. And it turns out that one of the nicest ways to do that is to first calculate the Delaunay triangulation, and then this concept of the Euclidean minim minimum spanning tree, EMST, um, which is that network I just described, which minimizes the total weight of the edges. It's not a triangulation, so we're not connecting them, the points maximally, we're just connecting them sort of so that they're connected once to each other. Um, that's a subgraph of the Delaunay triangulation, so you can draw that from the Delaunay triangulation, and that vastly reduces uh, the number of permutations of, of edges connecting points that you have to consider, that the algorithm has to consider. So you save a lot of time by doing the Delaunay triangulation first, and then using other algorithms that take that and, and find the Euclidean minimum spanning tree. Um, so you get sort of a head start using the Delaunay triangulation. Um, so I think the example is, uh, I just used the, the example of a computer network connected by edges. Um, again, we create this triangulation object from the computer positions, um, and then basically go through, generate, let's plot, did I plot this? Yeah, I have a plot here. So the, the black lines are the Delaunay triangulation, which contains the met, sort of the maximal, um, the maximum number of edges connecting the points, um, and also avoids skinny triangles. Um, and then the Euclidean minimum spanning tree is, again, it's a subgraph of that. So these, these parts that are highlighted in green are actually, that's how you would save the money in building your network. Um, so as long as you don't need to have the redundant connections, as long as the single connections suffice, so you can get from one node to another by following some path, then this is actually a really useful way to, to do that in an efficient manner. Um, and I think I had to use, yeah, so I did have to, to use um, another um, function within SciPy, which is scipy.sparse.csgraph.minimum spanning tree. Um, so by feeding in the undirected graph, which was generated um, with the help of the Delaunay triangulation, I was able to, um, to vastly simplify the process of generating this, uh, generating this network. Um, so you don't get the you don't get the answer just from the Delaunay triangulation, but that gives that puts you a step ahead in the process, and that is um, and that is a common a common way to do this sort of um, this sort of problem. So hopefully that's um, that might be useful for for some people. So now I'm just going to do um, the same thing I did with the the convex hull and just empirically measure the time complexity. So take um, take the number of generators, the number of points, and a huge list here. Go up to, I think I'm going up to a million. Yeah, I'm going up to a million again here. Just seeing how long it takes the computer to run that code. Um, I think it's a little bit slower. Um, and then just plot the results and see which time complexity that we, we fall into to see if the community can do better, for example. Yeah, it's a little bit slower than convex hull. Seven hundred thousand. I think actually, just while that's running, I think the limit for for convex hull you you can go up to about two hundred fifty million points, which is pretty impressive. So it does a pretty good job. It's quite efficient. Um, before the before you'll run into issues with um, with memory consumption. So let's just plot the results that we ran here, and. Uh, yeah, so it looks like, again, roughly, we're, we're not on the quadratic line, so that's good. Um, it turns out that the theoretical limit for Delaunay triangulation, convex hull, and Voronoi diagrams is log linear. And, okay, it's not perfectly on the, the log linear line, but it's pretty close. And um, this is also a fairly crude benchmarking approach. So um, so that's good. There's, there's really not much um, the, the community can do to make that better. I guess you could, you know, you could try to write the code under the hood a little bit more efficiently, but um, but overall, the algorithm that's chosen is, is the optimal algorithm for, for calculating the, the Delaunay triangulation. Um, so, so Voronoi diagrams are, as I have mentioned, they're the mathematical dual. Um, actually, someone, someone in a previous uh, talk actually asked me what the formal definition of mathematical duality is. I don't, I'm not sure I can provide a satisfactory answer to that. Um, but it's certainly very closely related to the Delaunay triangulation. And I mentioned this, this connection through uh, drawing the the lines between the the circumcircles that are drawn through the triangles, the the, the line triangulation. Um, so the the two diagrams are very very closely related to each other. If you have one, chances are you can generate the other one without too much trouble. Um, 
And Voronoi diagrams, actually, if you're working in another field, you may actually call it something else. So there's these thesin polygons and the Dirichlet um, tessellations. Um, but yeah, they were first seriously studied by um, Gregory Voronoi uh, more than 100 years ago. Um, and so, I mean, with Delaunay triangulations, we're, we're sort of focused on connections between the points in the data set. And with Voronoi diagrams, we're actually more concerned about, in some ways, in some senses, concerned about points that are not in the data set. So, um, what are the closest points outside of your data set to the points in your data set, for example, um, and having a really sort of um, useful way to, to, to plot that information. Um, so there's a lot of a huge, huge, huge number of examples and, and, and countless textbooks have been written about uh, Voronoi diagrams on, on different surfaces and in different applications. Um, a sort of classic example might be, you know, sort of marketing type example where you're, you're building a chain of stores and you want to know um, which residential locations are closest to which stores. Um, if you generate a Voronoi diagram, the cells of that Voronoi diagram, which are called the Voronoi regions, will tell you which, for example, which residential locations are closest to, to which store in your network. Um, so it's a very sort of convenient way to, to, to visualize the, um, the Euclidean um, closest distances to points in your data set, for example. Um, and um, formally speaking, so all Voronoi regions, all of the cells in a Voronoi diagram are convex, they're convex polygons. Um, and that can be proven, but I'm certainly not going not gonna to try to do that. Um, and general position, I think this is the same requirement as the Delaunay triangulation, which is that no four um, generators are co-circular. So none of the four, um, no four points in your input data set can be co-circular. Although QHAL may actually be able to handle that under the hood. I haven't tried that, but, um, but QHAL usually does a good job of filtering out degeneracies. Um, so people have studied Voronoi diagrams for quite a long time, but actually, because computational geometry is, is, is a fairly young field, um, many of the papers aren't actually that old. Um, so we've got an algorithm in 1975, divide and conquer, which is optimal, log linear. Um, there's the incremental algorithm, which is um, quadratic. Um, there's a quad-edge data structure, which I know nothing about, which is log-linear. And there's the famous algorithm from Steve Fortune, who was working at Bell Labs. Um, it's a sweep-line algorithm, which is um, log-linear, so it's also optimal. And as the name uh, may imply, the way this algorithm works is, is it generates the Voronoi diagram as you move from the left to the right along the x-axis in two dimensions. So it's a sweep-line algorithm. Um, and log-linear performance is known to be, is known to be optimal. So I thought I'd um, take you through some practical problems using um, the scipy.spatial implementation for, for Voronoi diagrams, which is scipy.spatial.voronoi, um, which again, as it turns out, is actually just using QHAL, this, this well-written uh, C-level, very fast library under the hood. It's just exposing that to, to Python for convenience. So we'll start off with a 2D example. I think I've also written, a, yeah, I've written a 3D example in here as well. And this 2D example is, um, I think it's actually considered one of the first uh, modern examples of um, uh, epidemiology, population epidemiology. Um, and so this is the classic example of um, the, the London um, cholera outbreak 150 years ago. Um, so people were dying and, and they were trying to figure out why. And so a physician by the name of John Snow um, basically collected some mapping data in terms of where the fatalities were and where the water pumps were in, 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 in the city of London. Um, so I'm just pulling in that data here, just loading in the NumPy array data, which I've stored here, um, and plotting the results of a Voronoi diagram. And I think you'll, you'll probably be starting to get used to this call signature now. So if you look at the call signature for generating a Voronoi object, it's again, you basically just call scipy.spatial.voronoi, which is calling QHAL under the hood, and you feed in your input data, whether it be two-dimensional or three-dimensional or even more than three-dimensional. And that'll generate an instance of this Voronoi class, which then has various methods and attributes that you can use as you see fit to do your data analysis. Um, and because Voronoi diagrams are so fundamental and so heavily used, um, the developers of scipy.spatial decided that it would be useful to have an automatic plotting function that you can use as well. So for that, you just feed in your Voronoi object. Um, and you can actually modify that plot too, so you can, you can tell it which axis of the matplotlib. If you're familiar with matplotlib, you can tell it which axis that you want it to use, and then use that to add other things to your plot, which is what I've done here. So I've taken the default plotting routine and added some, some bells and whistles on top for, um, for clarity. Um, so this is the Voronoi diagram as it's plotted. Um, 
it's worth noting that those dashed lines, and this is sometimes a little bit hard to wrap your head around, um, those dashed lines go off to infinity. Um, so sometimes when you're doing an analysis and you, you want to sort of exclude those, you just look for indices that are minus one. So the documentation makes this quite clear, but any edges that go off to infinity, um, you can exclude them by using minus one. So if you want to calculate the surface areas, for example, of the different regions, you might want to exclude the, the infinite areas, obviously, because you don't want to calculate an infinite area in your, in your algorithm. Um, so that's useful to, useful to know, um, but it's just plotted as a dashed line like that. Um, these blue dots are the pump locations from the data that, I, that I've loaded in from this person's blog at the University of Southampton. Um, and the red data is, is basically the original mortality data from, um, from, from, from London 150 years ago. Um, and so the diameter of these red dots is the number of fatalities at a given residence in London. Um, so this really large red, red diameter here means that there were a lot of fatalities at that particular residential location. Um, so th this is more or less what you might expect from, um, from a case of contaminated water where one of the pumps is contaminated with, um, with, the, uh, with the pathogen. But actually, some of the other cells are also polluted with, well, I shouldn't say polluted, but also have cases of, of human fatalities. Um, and uh, what they actually found was that most of these could be explained by people who actually anecdotally preferred to the taste of the water at this pump. So they would actually go to a pump that's farther away just because they like that pump more. Um, but you can see how this kind of analysis is quite useful for this, this type of thing, this type of epidemiology um, application. So I just think that's a, it's a nice it's a nice sort of intuitive use of of um, of a Werner diagram to look at a, a real problem that that can affect public health. Um, but certainly there are many 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 other applications. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna increase the complexity a little bit and go up to three dimensions. Again, going with this a fairly cooked up example that uses random data, but is nonetheless um, somewhat realistic. Um, so, you know, let's say that you're designing an autonomous drone that's flying over a city, um, which, um, which naturally has a lot of obstacles, whether they be tall buildings or other um, small and large air traffic. So, you know, I have this really large, complicated 3D data set with things moving around. And at any given point in time, you want to be able to assess the optimal path that the drone will fly or that the drone will follow um, while avoiding obstacles. Um, and it turns out that one really good way to do this is actually to calculate the 3D Voronoi diagram and send the drone along the path of the of the um, the Voronoi edges in that in that diagram. And it's the same sort of approach again. We, we're just generating RAM data in three dimensions, feeding that data into scipy.spatial.voronoi to generate an instance of the Voronoi object. So this is the Vor object right here. Oh, is that going? Is the monitor is going dark there. Maybe I'll just unplug that and plug it back in if I don't get in trouble. Should I? Okay, I'll do it. Hopefully it doesn't cause any kind of major disaster. Technical, AV person help. Well, I guess you all have it in front of you, so I'll keep talking for a little bit while, while he takes a look. I don't think I did anything wrong, but maybe, maybe. Um, so we have this, um, this sort of fancy, fancy map so a fancy map which shows just where the 3D um, Voronoi edges are. And then you could just send the drone along any of those paths depending on where it is. Um, so it's a fairly, I guess it's also a fairly intuitive example of um, just using Voronoi diagrams for very practical applications. Um, but one sort of issue with these three, I mean it looks like a mess, like all those little green lines and the yellow lines and the, the black dots and stuff. And if you want to make that a lot prettier or um, you want to do something else with the data, like for example, calculate um, a way to plot all of the polygons that surround the obstacles, um, that's actually a little bit harder. And there, there have been some complaints about, um, I think one user actually, and I have this development note down here, one user actually complained about, um, I think he said he spent an entire night trying to plot a 3D Voronoi diagram from the output of SciPod at spatial.voronoi. Um, and I tend to agree with him. I think it is a little bit, that would actually be a bit of a, a challenging take-home exercise for you to do is actually produce a nice plot with all of the polygons showing there. Um, so there is this issue here. I think it's, I have 7,103 is the number of the issue. So if you're interested in um, helping out with that or you, ha you also agree that that's something that should be improved, um, then I think, I think that's something that actually will happen because I know one of the, 
one of the core developers, I think Polly Vertanen, who's actually probably, I guess you could say, is in charge of the project at the moment, um, also agrees that we could probably do something about that particular, uh, particular data structure. Maybe pr provide some kind of data structure that makes it really convenient for the end user to quickly plot the data um, so we can produce a nice 3D Warner diagram. So I think that's one of our, one of our weaknesses and um, maybe something that you've already experienced or maybe something that you will um, experience if you work with 3D Warner diagrams. And, um, but certainly something that I think will, in the future, change to be more convenient with scipy.spatial. Um, I could switch to um, VGA if that's... You don't have that? Okay. Um, I tried it. Yeah, you want me to do it again? Or? Yeah, that's what I first did. Yeah, I'll just keep going, I guess, for now. If nobody's too annoyed, no. Okay. So um, the next thing I did, is, and this is the same thing I did with convex hull and with the Deline triangulation, is just to make sure that we believe that we have a, sort of a high quality algorithm implemented for um, scipy at spatial at Voronoi, and just to measure the time complexity. Sure, I can. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yeah. That that's from the the green lines are from the three dimensional Voronoi diagram. So they they would actually form these um, these large polygons. Um, so those are the edges of polygons. If you can imagine a whole bunch of sort of tetrahedra in space, um, those would be basically formed around the obstacles. So each of those obstacles is sort of in the middle of one of those polygons, a three-dimensional polygon, and the green lines are just the edges that define those shapes in 3D space. Yeah, that's right. And, and actually, when you're generating Voronoi diagrams, it, it's quite common to call the input points the generators, so they generate the Voronoi diagram. So the black lines are the obstacles or the generators, and the Voronoi vertices in yellow are determined by the positions of those generators. Yeah, but I agree with you. It's actually a little bit confusing what's going on. We'd like to have a more convenient way to plot that, or an, an, another way to plot it as well, so that um, so that people can can sort of quickly figure out what's going on. And I think that's one. Of, that's a valid complaint from from users. Yeah, because it, because it's on the edge of your data set. Yeah, so I think those actually aren't. Well, I think the reason it's not plotted here is because I've plotted the data, so that's why we see these lines going off to nowhere, basically. So some of those probably are lines at infinity. Not all of them are, but, but many of them would be. Um, and that's just another case of we need a better way to handle this, handle this data so that the end user can conveniently um, not have to do a ton of work to get it in a, in a really sort of tractable, tractable format. Yeah, that, that's because there's a built-in plotting routine in, in SciPy at Spatial for 2D, but not for 3D. And I think that's something that probably will change in the future, um, or, or at least will, will be a little bit less um, hectic to deal with for 3D data sets in the future. The, the inputs there are actually the pumps. So those, those blue lines are the pumps, yeah. Sorry, the blue dots are the pumps. Yeah, the fatalities are just extra data that I've added on to see if the Voronoi diagram makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because we want to know who lives closest to the, to the pump that has the infection, and just we want to see if people are dying near that location. So it's just an example of using the Voronoi diagram to get the initial data, and then to take some real-world data and see if the Voronoi diagram makes sense. So a way of visualizing if distance is consistent with, uh, with what we're seeing. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have an HDMI. I do have a VGA, though. Do you want me to try the VGA cable? Is that OK? Well, hopefully most of you have a, the screen in front of you, so I'll just keep, I'll just keep going. Um, uh, right, so I was going to benchmark. Uh, OK, we're back. So I was going to benchmark scipy.spatial.voronoi, I'm just using the exact same format that I've been using throughout the talk. So just take the list of points for a different number of points, generate a random data set with that number of points, and just see how long it takes to do this operation, scipy.spatial.voronoi. So I'll run that. <coughs> 
Again, it's not super, super fast. Um, well, I shouldn't say it's slow because I didn't write it and it's really well written. But um, but yeah, it takes because we're going up to a million points. It does take a while to do the to do the to do the execution. So we're at half a million, almost there. Seven hundred thousand, but ten seconds. One thing that people often want to do is calculate the surface area of the polygons as well. Um, there's no way in SciPy at the moment to do that um, conveniently. Um, it, I mean, for, for planar polygons, you can just look it up on, on Stack Overflow, for example, or look it up on, online. Um, but I think in the future, and I'll mention this a little bit later, um, that's something that I also like to see written into SciPy as a really convenient way to very quickly calculate the surface areas of all the polygons um, in the data set. Um, so we'll just plot those benchmark results, and um, well, maybe you're not surprised anymore. It, again, we're, we're right, we have roughly log linear performance. It's not quadratic, and um, and so scipy at spatial dot Voronoi, and more fundamentally, the, the QHAL code underneath it is written in, an, in a performance optimized manner. So that's the formal theoretical limit. Um, so we're actually doing pretty good, and there's not there's probably not much room for improvement in that particular in that particular algorithm. So now I'm going to talk to something that I, well, I guess I know a fair bit about it because I wrote it into, into SciPy. Um, and actually, so when I gave this talk uh, at PyCon last year, this wasn't actually even in SciPy.spatial, so it wasn't available in the, 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 the master branch release. Um, so, uh, or sorry, it wasn't available in the, the widely released version, so people who wanted to follow along actually had to, to clone the, the master branch from the SciPy repo and, and do it that way. So, But actually, this year we were actually we're actually two versions past the implementation. So we've had point 0.18, which was the original release of, um, of, of uh, SciPy at Spatial at Spherical Voronoi. And we now also have 0 0.19, which is the, the most recent stable release, which actually has improvements to, to SciPy at Spatial dot, dot Spherical Voronoi. Um, so as the name implies, this is for calculating Voronoi diagrams on the surface of a sphere, uh, which is something that I do a lot for spherical viruses that cause human illnesses. Um, but it is also, from my interactions with other people, something that's actually quite commonly performed for, um, for calculations on the surface of the Earth, for example, so in, in geographic applications. Um, a, you can find a few actually really nice examples online, of, for example, looking at um, you know, the, the Voronoi diagrams around airports in the world, so what regions are closest to which airport, and um, if you had a search and rescue operation, which airport is closest to that particular region in, in the ocean, for example. Um, but I've actually had people working in MRI, so doing brain scans, who actually wanted to do, to do spher spherical Voronoi analyses, emailing me about this sort of stuff. And um, yeah, there's all kinds of applications for this type of thing. Um, now, the, the, it turns out this is actually fairly recent mathematical literature. So the last 10 to 15 years, there's been, there's been some algorithm development with spherical Voronoi diagrams. Um, and I'll just tell you that the, the formal um, theoretical optimum is the same as the planar diagram case. So log linear is the optimal, and I think actually in 0 0.19 we're getting, if we're not there yet, we're at least really close to being there for, um, for most of the data sets that I've seen. So it's actually getting a fair bit faster than it was. Initially it was looking like quadratic time complexity, but, um, but now we're getting quite close to the, to the theoretical optimum. Um, so originally I, I actually gave this talk in, in London, England about maybe two, maybe even three years ago. And um, there, was, there was, fortunately, there was a mathematician in the audience because the algorithm wasn't really working that well. It's actually fairly easy to get, the, um, to get the vertices because it turns out that the convex hull of the points on the surface of the sphere, um, that contains the Voronoi vertices. The only problem was, the, the challenge we had was just to get the actual um, ordering of the points in the region, so to get the polygons on the surface of the sphere. Um, so it was initially implemented in point 18, but there were some there were some issues with the space complexity. This is this concept I mentioned before, in terms of the amounts of um, space that the algorithm requires, the amount of physical memory that it uses on your computer. It was way too high, and so people were opening issues on on, on the GitHub tracker for for SciPy, saying that well, I have a data set with 200,000 points on the surface of a sphere, and my computer's crashing every time I run your your code, so so people weren't super impressed by <laughs> super impressed by that. So I said, okay, what's going on? Um, then I just I found some cases where I was indeed not not being careful enough about the sizes of my data structures, and so I was able to make some improvements, which are available for those of you that have SciPy 0.19 installed. 
Um, those are available in that version, and we can now handle about at least 10 million points on a modern computer. Um, if you have a really small amount of physical memory, you might have to stop a little bit before 10 million, but certainly 10 million has worked in most machines that I've tried. Um, that does take a few minutes to run. I'd like to bring that down to, um, to a few seconds, but that's sort of work, a work in progress. And obviously it's volunteered time, so I don't do that, that, that kind of thing full time. But we're certainly getting to, um, to a point where this is starting to work a lot, a lot, lot better. Um, so somebody opened a sort of bug report for the space complexity, and I, and I patched that. And it, it also just turns out that the code now runs much faster as well because it's using a more efficient, uh, more efficient data structure. Um, so yeah, I've just mentioned here about, about five minutes on this, this laptop here for 10 million input points. Um, we're still a bit of a ways off from the sort of super bare metal optimization that you'll get from these sort of world-class libraries like Seagal. But on the other hand, these libraries don't really offer um, scipy.spatial, or the, sort of the, the spherical Voronoi, and also the convenience of having Python, um, Python at your fingertips without having to worry about the sort of super low-level code. Um, but things like convex hull and scipy.spatial, which use QHull under the hood, um, which is a sort of world-class computational geometry library that can handle about 200 million points. Um, so we still have a bit of work to do to get up to that standard, but, um, but at least people can now, you know, for reasonably sized data sets, they can at least get a result if they're willing to wait, you know, a minute or two for, for really large data sets. Um, and then, yeah, I, I've also, so SciPy 0.19 also contains some optimizations to um, the code that sorts the, the vertices. So if you have, if you measure like a polygon around an airport on the surface of the earth, if you just start off with its vertices, and you don't know what order they're in, you have to have some kind of algorithm for sorting how those, um, those vertices are. So if you want to plot the polygon or calculate its surface area, it's actually useful to have the vertices ordered. Um, and the sort of the naive intuition approach, which is maybe to use angles as you go around, is actually really, really weak and, and subject to issues with floating point um, imprecisions if the points are really close together. Um, there's another way to do that, and I've just made that a fair bit faster in the most recent version of, of, of SciPy, if you have access to that. Um, so, okay, obviously I'm passionate about that because I wrote it, and, well, I co-wrote it with, with Nikolai. Um, I think Nikolai's actually, I think he's actually now a, a banker, but, um, but yeah, great mathematician and, and really helped me out a lot with the, the implementation. Um, so I'm just taking, yes, I'm, I think I'm going to work with some random points on a sphere. Yeah, random points on a sphere. Yeah, so we've got some randomly distributed points on a sphere, um, and we're just gonna we're just gonna basically plot them and then compare the Voronoi diagram. The initial. So these are the random points on the left here in blue, and then these are the Voronoi regions. So each of those colored tiles is a spherical polygon. So it's like a curved polygon on the surface of a sphere, and each and each one basically has a random different color. Um, so you can imagine that that's, you know, there could be a disease outbreak and, and each of these polygons is um, basically enclosing the, the areas that are closest to that disease outbreak on the surface of the earth. Or again, we could go back to the airport example and imagine that you need to, um, you know, you need to in intercept jets from a certain country and you want to know which airports are closest for that interception process. Um, that's the sort of thing that you might do with, with the spherical Voronoi diagram. Now, actually, just as an aside, I mean, many of you probably don't care too, too much, but it turns out that I'm, I'm lying a little bit in the sense that matplotlib actually can't plot spherical polygons. So these are actually, they should, conceptually, they're spherical polygons, but in reality, it's actually just plotting planar polygons. So if I reduce this to a data set with four points, so four points is the minimum number of points that you need to formally define, define a sphere. So if we had four points on the surface of the sphere here, um, this would look terrible. And I think actually, if we look at the documentation, I'll just look up spherical Voronoi. I think it's, well, you'll see how bad it is. Spherical Voronoi, yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, it's not very, it's not very nice. Um, but anyways, we got, we got it into the library. Um, but this is what my plotlib does. So if you have a really small data set, this is more than four points, but not a lot more. Um, you can just barely believe that it does, but trust me, it does calculate spherical Voronoi diagrams. Um, this is an op there's an open issue for this in, in matplotlib. So if you're if you if you're really good with doing triangulations and the sorts of things that are needed for for rapidly plotting spherical polygons in a, in a sort of aesthetically pleasing manner, they're certainly looking for people to help out with that. Um, otherwise, I'll probably try to do it at some point, but. I always have I guess, more fun things that I'd like to do with open source time. Um, but if you have a fairly large data set, you don't really notice it too, too much. Um, but just something to be aware of if you actually have small data sets on a sphere, um, the plotting is actually a little bit awkward. There's other libraries like um, I think Mojave, some of the like Python libraries that have really heavy dependencies that can do 3D things really well. 
Um, but if you want to keep it a fairly lightweight workflow with matplotlib or whatever your library may be that's mostly written in Python, it, just know that, just realize that sometimes plotting these things can be a bit of a pain. Um, I've also had some recent feedback. This is just in the last few weeks. So some people have had issues with the code working, but then the results not making sense. And the issue there was basically that they had duplicate points in their data set. So I mentioned before that most of the scipy.spatial um, major algorithms like convex hull, Delaunay triangulation, and Voronoi, the conventional Voronoi in a plane or in 3D, um, those actually have sort of sophisticated um, C-level code for, for filtering out degeneracies. But the code that I wrote doesn't have that kind of filtering in, built in. So if your data has duplications or other sort of pathological properties, it may look like it worked, and then you look at it and something doesn't make sense, then it's a good idea to go back and check to see if there's um, something wrong with your data set. And this pull request here, and you can, you're welcome to go look at it or provide input or suggestions, is basically my attempt to start filtering the data um, so I'm, my approach is actually, I think, going to be slightly different if the core developers agree with this. Uh, it's basically, instead of going to give you, silently giving you a successful result, it's just going to raise a value error and say that either you have um, duplicates in your data set or something else is wrong with your data set. Another example is providing a sphere. You provide data points that aren't perfectly on a sphere. The algorithm requires your points to be perfectly on a sphere. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to put code in there. I've put code in there that checks for that. Um, but allows you to specify a threshold because there's always a, a floating point. So if one of your points is 0 0.0000001 off the sphere, maybe that's acceptable to you. So the idea that, um, that the core developers have provided is that we should allow the user to control what kind of threshold checks for, um, for, for, your, for your input. Um, so I suspect the developers of QHall have thought about these things in great detail for their algorithms, but as we incorporate new things into SciPy at Spatial in this manner, we do have to worry about these degeneracies and making sure that things are, are, are sensible at the input level so that people don't get super confused by, by output from pathological input. So, so that's a work in progress, and if you want to take a look at that, you're, you're certainly welcome to. Um, the other thing I've mentioned is um, for calculating the surface areas of spherical polygons. Um, so one of the sanity, sanity checks that I often do when I'm with these spherical Vorne diagrams is I, I say, okay, what's the theoretical surface area of the sphere? and then compare that to the sum of the surface areas of all the polygons on the sphere. They should be roughly the same. Um, but there's no super convenient way to do that at the moment. So people have emailed me, how do I do that? And then I just, um, I actually recently just told someone to take my SciPy tutorial and copy and paste the code that I use for this, for their application, which is obviously not the ideal way to distribute the code. Um, so this is something that I think is of interest, probably for implementation into SciPy. It might end up somewhere else, but hopefully it goes into SciPy. Um, and the idea is just to give you a really convenient and fast way to calculate the surface areas of all those polygons. Ideally in a way that you could sort of retain the indices so you, you, you know where the first polygon is. Then you get an array, an output array that tells you where the 31st polygon is and what its surface area is. So you have a quick way to, to conveniently get the areas of all of those polygons in your, in your data structure. Um, so the way that this was done, and this, this was um, the, the surface area of the spherical polygons, um, was done with a fair bit of help from, I think he's an astronomer in the UK. I think it's Ed, Ed Edmondston is his name. Yeah, he's at the University of Portsmouth. So he, my initial code was wrong and he corrected it for me. So I, I do have to, to thank him for that. Um, and it uses Lullier's theorem, which is a way to calculate the surface area of triangles. You break the system into a set of triangles, which is a very, very common way to calculate areas. And then basically calculate the area by summing up the, those, those constituent spherical triangles within the spherical polygon. Um, so I have this code here, and I'm just, what I'm going to do is basically just iterate through the spherical Voronoi regions. So sv.regions is just each of those polygons on the surface of the sphere, whether it be a small virus or um, you know, a, a roughly spherical planet. Um, and so yes, if we just sum through all of those areas using this informal code, it's not actually built into the SciPy yet, you can see that to, to many, many decimal places, the calculated surface area is a, is a match to um, four times the, the, the pi times, and the radius is one, so we've just excluded four times pi times the radius squared. Um, so that looks pretty good, um, but I, I just, I'd like to have that in a sort of vectorized way where we don't have to do a sort of a Python loop to calculate all of the surface areas and, and build that into, into SciPy. Um, and we're still sort of thinking about that because the problem is that, um, well, one problem is that, uh, so these polygons can have different numbers of vertices, and we think of the way, if you do a lot of NumPy work, you'll, you'll notice that you get these really sort of convenient ways to, to deal with data that's 
homogeneously shaped, right? So if you have an array that has um, you know, 50 rows by 10 columns, you can easily just calculate the square root by using numpy.squareRoot. Um, but what if your data structure is heterogeneous? So you have a whole bunch of polygons on the surface of a sphere, but some of them have five vertices, some of them have 11 vertices, some of them have three vertices. How do you turn that into a really fast vectorized NumPy set of operations? So that's a sort of interesting problem that, you know, I, that struck me as something that was challenging enough that I didn't want to tackle it right away. Um, the solution that most people I've, I've, I've talked to about this have suggested is that you probably just have to break it down into triangles somehow, and then those triangles will give you your homogeneous data structure. But you'd still have to find a way to, to map the triangles back to your original data structure if you want to figure out which area corresponds to which of the original polygons. So, so maybe that's a development idiosyncrasy that you don't care about, but I just thought you might, uh, you might find that interesting. That's the sort of thing that we're, we're thinking about for the future of, uh, of, um, of scipy.spatial. And the next section is, is completely new. I've never talked about um, this stuff before in the context of computational geometry or scipy.spatial. Um, but it turns out that there is, there's a bit of shape comparison code in, in, in scipy.spatial, and I've recently added some more, and the core developers are actually interested in, in expanding this a fair bit as well. So, so we're hoping to make this a fair bit more robust um, as, as, as future releases of scipy come out. And the, um, so the only one that was, was available before, the only shape comparison that was available for SciPy 0 0.19 was um, Procristi's analysis. I don't know if any of you have heard, this bef heard of this before. It, it's used a lot in, um, um, in statistics and in certain fields of computer science as well. Um, and just as a sort of anecdotal background, sort of fun facts, Procristi's was um, a son of Poseidon in Greek mythology, and he would invite visitors to stay at his place as they were, I think, yeah, as they were heading towards was it Athens, I think as they were heading towards Athens. And unfortunately for the visitors, he would, he would force them onto his bed and he would make them fit the bed, like forcefully. So if they were too tall for the bed, he would cut their limbs off so they would fit the shape of the bed. And if they were too short for the bed, he would stretch, stretch their limbs so they'd be completely stretched into the bed and, and fit into it. Um, so this is a very forceful analysis. You take one shape, you take two shapes and you try to force them to be like as close together as possible. So if you have two different shapes, if one is really small and one is really big, you're allowed to make one of them bigger in, during the shape comparison process. Um, if one of them is translated really far away along the x-axis, you're allowed to translate that so that its center is translated in an optimal way to match the other shape. Um, so you do pretty much everything that you can to, to, to make the objects similar to each other in terms of size and translational position. And sometimes you're even allowed to reflect it. So if you're comparing a left hand and a right hand, you're allowed to do a reflection process as well. Um, so the idea is to really focus just on the shape in question and not on um, other, other idiosyncrasies of the comparison. Um, oh yeah, so actually, so just, yeah, if you care, um, he was actually, um, Christie's was eventually killed by the Greek hero um, Theseus, who's the person over here. And he was killed by um, being put on his own bed and being treated the same way as he treated his visitors. So that was how he was uh, killed. Um, so we have sci-fi at spatial procrustes because of, because of all that, I guess. Um, and I, I've started off with a really simple example, which is um, two circles. Um, so I think um, it's fairly straightforward. Um, I'll just, I'll just show you, re-execute the code and show you what we're dealing with. So we have one small circle, which is the blue one on the bottom left, and one really big circle, which is in the top right there. And we just want to compare these two shapes. And I think intuitively, because I've mentioned that you can, you can change the translation, you can change the size, um, we would expect the Procrustes distance or dissimilarity between these objects to be the smallest it can possibly be. So these, are, these have identical shapes as far as Procrustes analysis is concerned. Um, but let's just um, let's just check that using the built-in scipy at spatial to see if that's in fact the case. Um, and uh, Procrustes gives a maybe slightly confusing output here, and this I mean this tutorial is the first time that I actually had to use Procrustes analysis. Um, so it gives this sort of tuple of of outputs. So we get a reference matrix out, we get a fi fitted matrix out. Um, the third value is probably the one that's often of interest, which is the sort of disparity or the the sort of um, the floating point value that tells you how different your shapes are. So I'm just feeding in the x and y coordinates of the of the two circles as numpy arrays, two procrustes, and then I'm going to start off by plotting the fit result. So it it basically tells you scipy will tell you 
how it adjusted the shapes. Um, so we, it, you have the circle one and circle two input, and then, oh no, oh, I probably didn't execute this properly. I had to hit that first, and then hit that. Yeah, there we go. So you can see that now the blue and the yellow data sets are right on top of each other. So, so SciPy at Spatial that Procruce, these returned a reference matrix which contained one of the two circles being adjusted to the position and size of the other because it's allowed to change the translation and it's allowed to change the size of the, sh of the object as long as it cha doesn't change its fundamental shape. Um, so as you'd expect, the, 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 two, the two circles are directly superposed on each other. Um, and if we look at the value of the disparity, um, we can see that it's, you know, it's you know, 10 to the power of minus 31, so it's, it's effectively zero, um, the disparity between these two objects. Um, so that, that, I mean, that's really simple, but it's also quite powerful. So if you had um, two objects or two images and you could, you could simplify that to the, for example, the data points on, on its border, then you could have a way to, to quantify how different those two shapes are, um, especially if they're different sizes and all you care about is the difference of the shape. Um, that's a good way to fundamentally compare the two. Um, and so I've, I, I've made a, this is sort of artificial, but um, real world application type example where we have um, two, for example, two bone structures and we wanna know um, how similar they are. So this is, you know, okay, bones are a little bit more complicated than this, but it's random, it's sort of pseudo random data, so just bear with me. So we have this sort of rectangular object and a slightly more complicated object. And we wanna know um, what the Procrustes um, shape difference between these objects is. Um, so we use the same approach. We use SciPy at spatial at Procrustes, um, comparing the two objects. And now we're gonna plot the superposition. So this is more complicated than the case with the circles, right? So now, now the superposition isn't perfect. So it's basically just minimized. It, it minimizes the sum of the squared differences between all the different points. Um, that's a fairly common way to superpose things. It's done a lot in biology, actually, when we're comparing the shapes of proteins, for example, um, but, but in many field, other fields as well. Um, so maybe you can see how, uh, so obviously they're, they're now, and this, this purple shape, so bone number two, has been expanded in size. Because again, we're, we're only concerned with Procruci's analysis, we're only concerned about the shape. We don't care about the size or the translational position, just the shape comparison. Um, and so here, if we check the disparity, yeah, 0 0.285. So that's a lot bigger than you know, 10 to the negative 31st power. So obviously, these two shapes differ by a lot more than those two circles with different radii. Um, so yeah, maybe just something to keep in mind if you're ever comparing um, two shapes and you don't care too much about the differences in translational position or um, their, their scaling, then Procruci's analysis could be an appropriate method for, for you in that case. Um, so now moving on to the only other type of uh, shape analysis that's available in SciPy that's spatial, um, which is something that I wrote, and it's only available in SciPy 0.19. So for those of you who don't have that running for whatever reason, and to be fair, it's a really recent version of SciPy, um, you won't be able to, to execute that particular example, but, um, but you, can, you can always just, um, just, yeah, just listen to me describe it and show you how it works, and if, if that's ever useful to you, then, 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 um, then SciPy will have that, that feature available moving forward. Um, so this is the pull request where, where, I, where I wrote the code. Um, it was inspired, and in, in, in my understanding of how this works was, was largely driven by interactions with um, a group at Arizona State University. I think I've mentioned them farther down. I just wanted to mention, I think they're actually at the next section. But um, So it's Oliver Beckstein's lab at Arizona State University. And one of his students, um, Sean Saylor, wrote um, a lot of the initial code for these for these functions, and in the case of the Hosdorf distance, I just found a paper that had a more efficient implementation and thought that that would be something really useful to put into, into SciPy. So, um, but I, I should definitely acknowledge them for, for bringing this metric to my, to my awareness and, 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 um, and uh, sort of inspiring me to write the code for that. Um, so it's a slightly tricky concept. So here we, we're actually interested in, in a sort of maximum minimum. So it's the maximum minimum distance between um, two data sets. And, uh, you know, I could try to go through the, the formal definition, but it's way, way easier to just look at a, a plot of, of a simple example of, of how this works. Um, so, so I basically, ha again, have two circles. This time they're concentrically arranged. So there's a, a circle with a larger radius and then a circle with a smaller radius inside of it. Um, but circle two, the data set for circle two, you'll notice has an outlier at, on top there. So at a value of y equals three up here, there's an, sort of an outlier in that data set. Um, 
So the directed Hausdorff distance, so the, the Hausdorff distance from circle one to circle two is actually fairly small. So, so what you would do intuitively is go through all of these points on circle one, one at a time. So take one of these points, measure its distance to all of the points in the other data set, and then take the minimum distance. So the closest point between this point here, the closest distance between this point here, for example, and any point on circle two, which as you can intuitively guess would probably be this point here or one of these points that's really close by. So going from circle one to circle two, the Hausdorff distance is roughly the difference in the, difference in the radii of these two circles. Um, we don't have to worry about this outlier going from circle one to circle two because the closest distance from circle one to circle two is never going to have to involve that. So we, uh, we always just have these points here that are available for those distances. But the directed Hausdorff is asymmetric. So the, the distance from circle two to circle one will actually have a maximum minimum distance that is larger. So the maximum minimum distance is the Hausdorff distance. So the Hausdorff distance from circle two to circle one will involve this outlier. It will be the distance from this outlier to one of the points on the tip of circle one here. So hopefully that's a sort of intuitive way to understand that this asymmetric property uh, is different from, from circle two to circle one versus circle one to circle two. Um, so I'll just re-execute that code just to be safe. Um, and then, so we'll actually just see if that's actually true. So I've explained it in hopefully intuitive terms that um, the maximum minimum distance is larger when you have this outlier. Um, and let's just check that, recheck it. Um, so C1 to C2, the distance is about one, where C1 is the blue one inside. And C2 to C1, the distance is about twice as large, which I think you can believe based on the distance of this outlier being roughly a full unit farther away than the other points on, on, on circle two. Um, so actually, most people usually are concerned about um, the general Hausdorff distance, which is the maximum of the two. So in this case, what you would do is you would just take the maximum of um, the directed Hausdorff distance in both directions. But when I was implementing it into SciPy, um, I was aware of the fact that some people do actually care about the asymmetric property, so I decided to implement the most fundamental version of the distance so that people who need to get the fundamental version can. But most people will actually just want the maximum of the two, so you would just take the maximum of, of this in both directions. Um, so run the function twice and taste that, take the maximum of that. Um, the other useful thing that it does, and this was inspired by the academics at Arizona State University, is that it'll tell you the indices of the points that correspond to that distance, right? So we're expecting that the maximum minimum, which is the Hausdorff distance, actually corresponds to this point here, contacting one of these points here. But it's good to have a visual confirmation of that index as well, just to be sure that that's what's going on. Um, so I think I've just, I've effectively just plotted, plotted the indices. I pulled the indices out using the data above. So you can see from the directed Hausdorff here that we have the index of C1 and C2 and the index on C2 and C1. And we're just gonna plot those points. And so this is the Hausdorff pair right here. So it's exactly what we'd expect. The, the, maxim, the maximum minimum distances between these two data sets or the directed Hausdorff distance um, is based on these points here, which SciPy conveniently provides for us. Um, and just as, I, as I've just mentioned, the most common thing is to get the general Hausdorff distance, which I've highlighted in bold right here, general Hausdorff distance. It's the maximum of the Hausdorff distance in the two directions, the directed going from C1 to C2 and the directed going from C1 C2 to C1, so, so that's the value of two. Um, and that, that sort of thing is used in, in certain specialized types of uh, shape comparison. Um, my colleagues at um, ASU were using it for looking at how proteins change, like different trajectories behave, how proteins change shape, but you could look at, you could also use it for looking at, for example, um, handwriting comparison, so different handwriting curvature, for example, um, and that's a really, um, fairly common application for the next thing I'm gonna talk about, which is the Frechet distance. Um, this is proposed for, for SciPy, the core developers seem on board for putting this in, um, but it's not available in any, any version of SciPy yet. Um, the major holdback on that right now is just that it's a bit more complicated than the Hausdorff distance to implement, um, but it also has strengths that the Hausdorff distance doesn't. So it's a very, very similar concept, um, but um, it's also sensitive to the ordering of the points. So if you were comparing um, two trajectories of, for example, vehicles on a map, and you want it to have some kind of metric or measurement of 
the, the direction that those, those vehicles are following along their paths, um, then Hausdorff isn't necessarily appropriate because it's not sensitive to the ordering of the points in your data set. Um, so yeah, just to give credit to the, to, the, to the people that inspired this work and that helped me revise the code for it, this is um, the first author of this paper, Sean, Sean Saylor, Arizona State, and he's a student of, of my colleague Oliver Beckstein at ASU. Um, and they actually, they've done a lot of work with fresh hay distance, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about this thing that we're thinking about building into, into SciPy.Spatial. And um, so many of these images, including this one, are from, are from their recent talks, recent scientific talks on the fresh hay distance. And this, this is the classic analogy that's used throughout the literature with the fresh hay distance, is an individual walking their pet, an individual walking their dog. So the, and they have a leash between the individual and the dog, and each, the person and the pet, basically follow different unique paths. And they're both allowed to walk at different speeds, but they're not allowed to backtrack, so they can't go backwards. And so they, each of them goes from, from the start to the end, and the idea is to find basically the, the distance, the, the minimum distance that allows them to follow those paths. So it's the path, each follows a path that minimizes the distance of the leash effectively. So stay on path, do not move backwards. They both have to get to the end. What's the shortest leash required? And I'm not sure about you, but I do find this a little bit harder to wrap my brain around than the directed Hausdorff. And perhaps it's not surprising, therefore, that the code is a little bit harder to write. Um, um, just to be clear, though, this isn't the sh this isn't the, the the leash the shortest leash required for all paths. It's just a single optimized path that allows the shortest possible leash. And saying that probably doesn't clear clarify a whole lot. But um, and yeah, the, I mean, there's equations. I don't think we should worry too too much about it. Um, maybe that. Um, yeah, it helps you believe that it's a bit of a pain to, pain to implement. But you're basically just looking for the, the, appropriate, um, the appropriate length for that leash. Um, and the computational cost is also, I think it's uh, re well, roughly quadratic. There's, there's two sort of varieties. To this. There's the continuous fresh hay distance and the discrete fresh hay distance. Um, as the names imply, it's pretty much what the names imply, right? So the discrete fresh hay distance is like the blue line and the red line. Those could be data points that you have in your data set. So just discrete data points. Um, but in a more formal mathematical context, people are sometimes interested in the continuous fresh hay distance, which con considers basically the, the full smooth curve from the start to the end of each. Um, so there are algorithms for doing both. Um, and as you might imagine, the discrete fresh hay distance is a little bit easier to handle. Um, and so most implementations that you'll run into are discrete fresh hay, um, if you do find. It's a bit hard to find implementations, actually, but you can find them. Um, and I, you know, I was looking at... Uh, I was looking at, you know, if it's going to go into SciPy, it should be pretty good. I think that's a, that's a fairly good standard to have. We shouldn't put um, bad code into something that's used as much as SciPy. So I was going through the literature and looking for something faster, something really, really nice, an algorithm that would convince the core developers that, yes, this deserves to go into SciPy. And I ran into a paper that was published three years ago, um, and they, they had somehow managed to compute the discrete for shade distance in subquadratic time, um, which is really impressive considering that a lot of the literature says that it's actually a quadratic algorithm. Um, so I took a look at the paper, and it was brutal. You get 20 pages of hardcore computer science stuff. So I just decided to email the authors because you know I, I wanted to know if maybe they'd written it, written it in C or some other language that I could use as a, as a sort of basis for for writing the Python or, or at least the Cython version of the code. Um, and he actually said he's not aware of any actual implementation of the code, and he's not sure whether it's worth the effort for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah, so naturally my motivation didn't, uh, didn't increase when he said that. Um, and actually he felt that the quadratic algorithm was so simple that in many cases it, it's probably going to perform better because it's been fairly, fairly well optimized in certain applications. Um, so we may end up having to use the, just the, the, the quadratic, the, the n-squared algorithm for, for that. Um, but I'm still holding out. I'm going to visit actually Arizona State University in a few weeks and I think we'll, we'll discuss... Uh, We'll discuss some options for implementing Freshe and, and for making that, that, that aspect of SciPy a little bit stronger. Um, so hopefully in the future um, we'll have something like that. Um, just to emphasize what, you know, why, why all this 
concern and effort about this, and you know, if Hausdorff is doing something very similar, um, just to emphasize that, that the Frisch distance is sensitive to backtracking. So when you're doing any kind of analysis um, that, that involves you know, particles moving along paths or vehicles or whatever moving along paths, the Frisch distance is sensitive to backtracking, um, or, um, whereas the Hausdorff distance is, is not sensitive to, to, to directionality. So even if an object is not allowed to move backwards in Formo Frechet, it can still sort of loop around and Frechet distance will be able to deal with that, accommodate that in its metric. Um, but in practice, um, um, you can get quite far with the Hausdorff distance and, and, and in, in a large number of scenarios, there will be very similar results from the two. Um, so at least we have the directed Hausdorff distance um, and that can get a lot of people started with these kinds of, these kinds of analyses if they need to. Um, there's also a lot of different um, varieties of Frechet distance and Hausdorff distance as well, really. Um, but there's also the weak Frechet distance, which means that um, um, the dog and its owner can backtrack, so they can actually move backwards and forwards. Um, there's the geodesic Frechet distance, so some of you work in geographic information systems. This may be of, of some use to you, um, which adds the additional complexity of an obstacle, so the leash has to go over a rock as you're walking the, the, the dog, for example. And there's also the homotopic Frechet distance, which means that um, the leash actually has to be large enough that it can actually sort of, the part that goes over the rock actually has to be accounted for in the distance as well. Um, so I'd like to implement all of these into SciPy. I think SciPy should be as useful as possible and things should always work really well. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what I can actually manage to get in. And, um, if there's things that you think really should, really should be in there and would be really used by a lot of people, um, certainly do let me or let the developers know by opening an issue. And um, people do, do keep an eye on those issues, so, so, so do let us know. Um, so I've got an example here. I actually don't, okay, so this is, yeah. So this isn't, this isn't strictly speaking, a, a SciPy example. This is just an example of something that you could do with the discrete Frechet shade distance that would work better with Frechet than it would with, with the Hausdorff distance. Um, so I've got, basically, I'm coming back to this example of, of an autonomous vehicle because it's a sort of fairly timely topic. Um, and, um, you know, you might have a lot of vehicles um, moving along different paths, and you have a, a desired reference path and an actual path that you want those vehicles to follow. And if you just take um, the sample path from one of the vehicles and compare it with the actual path, okay, this, this vehicle isn't doing a very good job at the moment, um, but you want to know... Um, in a quantitative way, so if you have a lot of different um, programmings of this vehicle, you want to know which programming is working the best, and human visual inspection, in this case, probably isn't going to be very good at quantifying the fit unless one is really, really close and one is really, really far. Um, so I've just generated some random data and just plotting the random data, the actual path versus the reference path, and then I'm going to start off, I think, with the directed Hausdorff because that's built into SciPy to see what value we get. So we get a value of 0.12 for the difference between these two paths with, with the built-in Hausdorff. And then I'm just going to try using the Frechet code. This is actually copy and pasted from a, a library that actually has the, this is a domain-specific library that has the Frechet code implemented by my colleagues at Arizona State University. Um, and just using that to, to calculate the Frechet distance. And you can see that that's about 0.9, which is a fair bit bigger than the 0.12 value we got for, for Hausdorff. So obviously I've cooked this up a little bit. I've, I've picked two data sets where obviously things are changing direction a lot and, and Hausdorff isn't going to be sensitive to those changes in direction. So even though the, the overlap between the paths is quite high, because there's, um, there, there are differences in direction at various points is actually quite substantial. They're turning in different places. Even though there's a lot of overlap, in this case it would be more, you'd have a more sensitive metric if you used Frechet versus Hausdorff. Um, so, so, th so that's why I think it's worth eventually having that, that sort of functionality in, uh, implemented into, in, into SciPy. Um, but it's certainly not there yet. Um, so we're getting closer to the end. Um, I've, just, I've added in this miscellaneous topic section for, um, I think there's just one other thing that I, that, I, that I had found. I basically went through SciPy to Spatial and looked for like, everything I could find because it turned out I actually hadn't used a decent percentage of it even though I contribute code to to the library. Uh, obviously, computational geometry is a, a very wide field, so, or a broad field, so it's not surprising that I hadn't touched on everything in, in, in the library myself. Um, and I found this, um, this thing on hyper rectangles. Um, I'm still not sure I'm the right person to say what the formal definition of a hyper rectangle is, um, but apparently it's just a generalization of rectangles to higher dimensions, if you can believe that. Um, 
And I don't think I've ever had to use hyperrectangles directly, um, but it turns out that probably most of us have used them indirectly because, um, for example, KD trees, which are used in a lot of contexts, um, do depend on the usage of hyperrectangle code to divide space um, when they're generating the trees. Um, but I thought I'd just pull out, I had originally found scipy at spatial.rectangle. I think this was actually mostly just written for KD tree, so usage within the internals of scipy. Um, but since I found this, I'll just show you, I just try to explore it just with one or two examples of what you can do with scipy at spatial.rectangle. I didn't want to go higher than three dimensions. Um, I guess for fairly obvious conceptual reasons. Just, let's just stick to three dimensions and not go any higher, um, although you certainly can. I think a lot of people who work with um, complex database searching, um, sort of theoretical database searching um, algorithms do actually think about uh, hyper rectangles in higher dimensions, um, but I'm, I'm not gonna try to explain that because I'm, I'm certainly not the right person to do that. Um, so, so the way it, it seems that you have to define these, these hyper rectangles in, in SciPy is basically to provide the lengths of the edges as a set of minimums and maximum values. So you provide the maximums. This is a unit cube, so all of its sides are one. One along x, one along y, one along z. So just put one, one, one for the maxis and zero, zero, zero for the minimums into scipy at spatial dot rectangle. And just looking at the repr for the object, we just see zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. So okay, fairly straightforward. Um, and I was just looking through the documentation. There's a volume. Not really surprising the volume is one, so one times one times one is one. Fairly straightforward. So you're probably not sold that this is super useful yet. Um, the next thing I wanted to do was just split the rectangle, because I noticed there was this split method for the, um, for the hyper rectangle. So it splits the rectangle into child rectangles. And D is the dimension or the axis along which you want to split the rectangle. And split is the floating point value for the, the point on the axis where you want to split the rectangles. Um, so if I just, I'll just run that and then run this, and we just see that the first plane has been split, so 0 to 0 0.5 along the x-axis for this one, and 0 0.5 to 1 along the x-axis for this one, and the rest is the same. So my understanding is that we've just split that rectangle along an axis. Um, so I think I want it to plot the result, yeah. So I've just, the data structure is a bit strange, I'm just going to show you what happens if we plot that. Um, so the, these are the two child rectangles that we pull out. Um, the points in the middle overlap each other, so the second one that I plot will overtake the first, but there should be, um, there should be eight points for each of the rectangles. And you can see that what the result is exactly what we expect. So we, we split the two rectangles along the x-axis. Um, so maybe you've not been convinced that that's super useful, but if you, do, if you do ever have a scenario where you need to split a rectangle in a sort of arbitrary fashion like that, maybe this could be useful for you. Um, I don't think too many people actually use hyper rectangle directly, but, um, but maybe it's useful to know that it's there. And you can also calculate the volumes of those rectangles. And as you'd expect, if we, if we take a rectangle and we cut it in half, then, then, then each of the rectangles that result from that, or, um, or um, from cutting the cube in half, will have um, the same volume, so 0 0.5 each. Um, and I've also tried to calculate the minimum distance between um, it was the, the minimum distance between the child rectangle and the other one, which is zero, because that's because they have vertices that overlap when you split them in half, because they're still touching, basically. Um, what's going on? Oh, right. And this is the maximum distance between the two. So the maximum distance would, between, would be between, for example, this point in the bottom left and this point way up at the top right. Um, so that's a sort of Pythagorean type type distance right there. And I think I've just, just to show that it is indeed a, a Pythagorean distance, I've just done that calculation there. So I've probably not convinced you that hyper rectangles are super useful, and I don't think a whole lot of end users actually use that. Um, but it is used underneath the hood in scipy.spatial.kdtree. Um, and yeah, now you know that you know, something, something that maybe a lot of scipy users don't, uh, don't know. Um, so I guess there's only about 15 minutes uh, left, or maybe less, and um, yeah, I'm happy to discuss or, or hear any thoughts you have about things that um, that, go, that should go into scipy.spatial. Um, I'd certainly like to see vectorized um, spherical polygon surface area calculations go in there. For shade distance, eventually, I think you can probably do Voronoi diagrams for some other shapes like cones and that sort of thing. Um, but um, but yeah, if, if none of you have any um, burning ideas, that's fine. We'll just we'll just wrap up. But um, but do feel free to open um, issues on the the scipy mailing list.
or on, on the GitHub, and um, and I'm sure people will be happy to um, to consider implementing those those things. And um, yeah, thanks for coming. Right. Yeah. So the question, just for the for the recording, is um, basically human visual inspection is actually, um, in many instances, it seems like it, it would suffice just for for drawing the convex hull ad hoc. Um, the the problem is that people want an approach that works for a wide variety of data sets. So you you probably could. I mean, we saw that uh, this kindergarten geo board where you know like three or four year olds. Um, three or four year olds are, are able to do this just by inspection of, of, a, of a simple diagram. Um, the problem is that as you increase the number of data points, human visual inspection um, breaks down almost completely. So if you had 20 million data points, um, identification of the exact points in the convex hull is not particularly um, appropriate or useful or, or, or correct. Um, so, so you're right, it, it has a very intuitive um, analogy just based on simple visual inspection. Um, but um, even in two dimensions, um, when you have a large number of data points, it becomes extremely non-obvious, even by, by visual inspection, um, how you would deal with that, that, that approach. Um, so yeah, if, if, there, if, only, if people only ever needed to do convex hulls on five points in a plane, maybe we would never have bothered to develop the algorithm. Um, but because there's 2D, 3D, and more than 3D, 3D data, and data sets that are enormous, we do actually need computers to do this for us. And, and so we write the code to, to handle those particular cases. Right, okay, right, right. Yeah, so, so the, again, the question for the recording is just if you can, yeah, if we have a sort of heuristic approach where we, we maybe initially seed, seed, seed with what we think are the extreme points and, and provide those as, um, as initial input. I'm not aware of any way to, to make the convex hull algorithm faster by providing that information. I mean, maybe there is, but I guess the problem is how many scenarios do you have where you have that extra information? Right. Right. Yeah. I'm th I mean, I'm not aware of any of any cases where that where that's been done, but but it certainly probably could be possible that you could um, you could come up with an algorithm that um, that does an approximation of the of the convex hull. Although that said, we do formally know that even if you don't care about the ordering of the points, you're still constrained to log linear time complexity. So, and that that's only in the last twenty or thirty years of of research, right? So it looks like there, it looks like it's actually pretty hard to take shortcuts with convex hull, even though it's a simple concept, but. Um, but I agree with you. There may be opportunity for improvement if, if you just need an approximate boundary. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good idea. So the, the question is whether I've, I've considered using polygon strips to, to um, and this is presumably, you're presumably suggesting that I, I basically integrate the area um, using polygon strips to... Yeah. So the yeah. So the, the suggestion is to use, for example, um, triangle strips, as in as in three D graphics, to speed up this polygon surface area calculation. Um, so it, it turns out I, I was just looking at that on on, on the plane on the way here, and uh, the so there's a publication ten years ago from the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab at, at Caltech, and this is just a white paper publication, and they they basically mentioned that they actually had to generate some kind of simulation thing for the Army, which used spherical polygons. And there was just a lack of, there was lots of information about planar implementations, but almost nothing for spherical polygons. Um, and so, yeah, th their suggestion was actually to use, um, to use, basically use strips. You basically use the meridians, like the, these sort of vertical lines that come down along the surface of the Earth, for example, um, and basically integrate the areas under those to, to, to perform the calculation. Um, I think formally that's an approximation, but it's usually considered good enough. Right. 
Yeah, so, so I absolutely agree with you that this is, this is definitely a direction that we should, and I think we, I should try to avoid dealing with any kind of, um, you know, calculating the radian angles of, 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 of polygons inside other polygons, and I think that's just going down a, a rabbit hole. And, um, so yeah, I think that's certainly something I'm gonna try to ad explore um, for, for the implementation. I don't know if it'll work great, but I'm, I'm certainly gonna try it. Um, yeah. Good.